Thank you. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, so nice to see the audience all filled up this first time for a while. And uh, welcome, and welcome to the last regular council meeting of the uh, of this council. Sad days, but thank you for uh, thank you for being here. And this will be the revised agenda for the regular council meeting mm -hmm. Monday, October twenty fourth, twenty twenty two. On opening the council meeting, we acknowledge with gratitude that we live, work, and play in the traditional unceded territory of the Cree Nation, whose people for millennials, millenniums, have uh, been stewards of these lands and waters surrounding the Cree First item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda, introduction of late items. I saw them as everybody got the late item. Mm -hmm. Okay, any uh, issues with the agenda that people would like to yep. additions or anything? Or big uh, just at 11.6, after 11.5, after 11.6, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. recognition of outgoing elected citizens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got it here. Okay. So are you going to make that 11.7? Um, sure. Uh, no, we'll make that 11.6. I'll move the other one around. All right. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything? Okay. Well, with that, we will put uh, the agenda uh, by consent, as amended by consensus. We want public comments. What do we got, Sophie? Uh, first, we have Bob Turner, and he is on the Zoom. Okay, good. Bob, Hi, Bob. Yes. Hello, um, am I on? You're on, you're on. Hello, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here tonight representing the Bowen Island Conservancy. Uh, our board nominated Will Husby for the Islands Trust Community Stewardship Award. And we are so, so delighted that the Islands Trust has uh, honored Will with that award. So on behalf of the Conservancy, I wanted to make a few personal reflections um, about Will. First of all, for someone as accomplished as Will, he rarely beats his own drum. He's a pretty humble guy. Um, he's always willing to volunteer, offer good ideas, do the hard work, have fun doing it, hit the deadline, and yet he never seems to need to ask for any credit. It's, he's sort of a remarkable guy that way. He's just sort of happy to get the job done. And I think that's, you know, a really wonderful quality because, you know, as it's been said, uh, I think Harry Truman said it, it's amazing what you can get done if you don't care who gets the credit. Um, Will has so many skills to offer as a uh, professional heritage and nature interpreter. Will brings to any group the insights and skills of um, a biologist, uh, an educator, a nature photographer, an illustrator, graphic designer, all, all wrapped up in his sort of patented, enthusiastic and positive view of life. So just a, a, you know, a wonderful addition to any group. And over the past uh, 30 years, there've been a lot of groups. Uh, he's contributed to the Nature Club, Eco Alliance, Bowen Can, Bowen Lift, Island Pacific School, Conservancy, and the municipality's own Environment and Climate Action Committee. In fact, I can't really think of an important environmental initiative on Bowen since the early 1990s that Will has not had some hand in. And um, it was recently that Will, who really pushed the Conservancy's Marine Atlas for Bowen across the finish line, not only is a, a writer co-author, but also is a key contributor of photos and its graphic designer. But I think most people recognize that Will's greatest contribution has been his leadership of nature walks here on Bowen through his um, very beloved Bowen Nature Club. He's guided, and this is astonishing, about 150 nature walks over the past 30 years. And nature walks, for anyone who hasn't been on one, are really where families and individuals are led through a forest or by a pond or along a shore observing and experiencing, learning through a guide, the stories behind what they're seeing, hearing, touching. And this is really where Will shines. He just loves sharing his knowledge and his very unique 
will husband metaphors and enthusiasm like um, how the hind legs of a caterpillar are akin to Velcro running shoes. You'll just have to ask <laughs> Will about that one. Or how the, um, let's see, the, the predaceous diving beetle beat Jacques Cousteau to the scuba tank by several million years. <laughs> Anyways, these are sort of, you know, brand, um, Will brand um, sort of ways of, of really engaging people with nature. And, you know, through those 150 walks, I'm sure he has touched the lives of thousands of Bowen Islanders, including so, so many kids, and um, really influenced how we collectively listen to and relate to nature. And I think you only have to read the, the words of the Bowen brand to realize how integral nature is to the way, you know, we Islanders see ourselves as a community and why we're so committed to this home place. So, I just wanted to say we're really, really lucky as a community to have Will. But just one last thing, before I give up the mic, I'd, I'd like to flip gears. Um, if I could have your permission, Mayor Gary there. And sure, go ahead, Bob. Uh, take this opportunity to say thank you to you all. Um, thank you, Mayor Gary and Councillors Dave, Maureen, Michael, Rob, Sue Ellen and Allison for all that you've given to our community over the past four years. Um, you've accomplished a heck of a lot that you can be proud of, including some really major infrastructure projects, some completed, some underway, that have really defeated the efforts of previous councils to initiate, let alone complete. And, and so, you know, my, my great thanks to you. Um, I've served as an elected official for Bowen. I have some inkling of what you've been up to over the past four years and what it's like. You know, as a council, you are the swirling heart of all the big <laughs> decisions for our island community. Um, the buck, it stops with you. And I remember well just that heavy weight that comes with making decisions on behalf of the community. There are so many different voices, you know, pushing, pulling, persuading, Sometimes those are welcome, sometimes they're hard to hear, sometimes they're well-informed, sometimes not so much. And there's staff advice to weigh and agenda materials to plow through. Um, and I think the 557 pages of tonight's yeah. agenda package pretty much says it all. Okay. You've got to struggle through all the shades of gray of a decision, knowing that you will be judged by some who are really happy to just see the black and white of the issue. Um, but all that said, you know, I really do fondly remember just how much I learned sitting on council, the good friendships that it spawned and the privilege of being part of a council staff team that works together through both tough times and successes and working all the time on really important community issues. Um, and I know my own understanding of our extraordinary little community group leaps and bounds during my time on council. So I really, really hope, you know, on this sort of final evening that you, you feel the same way and you remember, you know, just the remarkable contributions that you've made to our community. Um, and because you've done really great work for us all. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, for those very kind words. I appreciate Thank that. you, Bob. All right, Sophie. Next we have Jeanette Johnson. Hey, Jeanette. Tell us for all. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alistair Johnston. Uh, I'm one of the owners and one of the proprietors of Bowen Cider House and Meadowbrook Market. Um, and my glasses are due, so if I don't have a good uh, read of this, I apologize. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to explain our application for a land endorsement at Bowen Cider House. Our family purchased Meadowbrook Corner in 2004, and to date of it, have hand planted over 700 trees and 48 different varieties of heritage butter apples. Our family owned and run orchard based cidery has been open since June, producing traditional and varietal craft cidery using heritage apples, the majority of which are hand picked from our own orchards. Our production is done entirely on site. We have a market gardens growing produce, vegetables, and fruit, which we sell and cook in our Meadowbrook market. 
We enjoy providing a space where Bowen families and community can gather, such as Apple Fest, a community focused, family focused event, and a long table harvest dinner with fresh local ingredients. It was enjoyable partnering with local small island businesses and farms. Our current manufacturing facility is on ALR land, which has specified allowed uses, of which operating cidery, including ancillary uses, is operating a picnic area and a food and beverage service lounge is a, is a prescribed and promoted farm use. We are approved for an on-site store, tasting room, and picnic area. Approved hours are 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. We've applied to be able to sell our cidery by glass or bottle and serve our food and non-alcoholic beverages indoors and on our patio adjacent to the kitchen. Our capacity has been dictated by the BC Building Code. We've amended our requested hours to closing at 11 p.m. We applied for hours similar to businesses on Bowen, Artisan Eats, Barcelona, Rusty, the Snug Cafe, and Tuscany, which have approved hours of 9 a.m. to midnight every day. The pub and docks are both approved to close weekends at 1 a.m. Our planned regular hours are five days a week, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. weekdays and Sunday, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. on weekends. Being approved to open till 11 p.m. gives us flexibility to host fun community events such as the golf course which also has a closing time of 11 p.m. We have one of the largest parking areas of any business on Bowen, 23 existing spots and four overflow. We promote bicycle use with a large bicycle rack and are an e-bike charging station. We'd like to engage local artists to provide entertainment in the lounge area. There are no plans for loud amplified music or concerts. The same noise bylaw applies to us as any other property on Bowen, and will be strictly enforced. To date, we have had no complaints and strive to keep it that way. It's exciting to provide a menu showcasing locally produced farm goods, for example, our onion and cider soup. If you have a chance to try it, it's great. Uh, <laughs> lamb from our property and charcuterie boards celebrating seasonal local harvest. We engaged in neighborhood consultation. Our objective was to reach as many neighbors as possible. We expanded the communication area by an additional 200 meters further than required by the municipality. We knocked on doors, telephoned, and emailed. I only received one negative response from a neighbor who thought we were opening a pub, which we're not. We placed a letter to the editor in the undercurrent, inviting questions and making ourselves available at any time. Uh, it was brought to our attention that there was an email circulating about our application. One of the recipients offered to forward our invitation to an inform informational meeting at Meadowbrook at 4 p.m. yesterday on Sunday. We were looking forward to showcasing, showing the space to the neighbors and discussing the application, so we're disappointed that we had no responses and nobody showed up. Uh, we have not seen the original email circulated, but understand that it has misinformation about the proposed hours and events, which stems from, one or, from two weddings at a neighbor's property. We have had overwhelming response, overwhelmingly positive response to our application, with over 125 letters of support that we know of. This includes immediate neighbors on all sides of us. I would like to take the opportunity to read a few of the examples from letters of support, uh, starting with Bowen Cider House is on the public transit route and promotes visiting by cycle, supporting a reduced environmental footprint. We have come to expect quality products and services provided by the Cider House and its related businesses. It's little things like the expertise of the employees in presenting and preparing their products and the fact that Alistair has made the establishment a great mid-island meeting point, going so far as to provide water and treats for dogs and chargers for e-bikes. We do not object to the lounge application by Bowen Cider House. We are the immediate neighbors to the south of the cidery and we have never had a noise problem with previous events. Um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak, and I'm happy to answer any further questions. Please support our land application. All right. Thank you, Alistair. Bob Maureen. Could you just repeat again what your um, actual hours of operation will be? Uh, yeah. Um. Find them again. Uh, so what we are planning, our planned regular hours are five days a week, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. weekdays and Sunday, and 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. on weekends. Sorry, could you say that again? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> okay. Uh, five days a week, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekdays and Sunday, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. on weekends. Saturdays and Fridays. Yeah. Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah, Saturdays. Yeah. Thank you. And, you. and you said five days a week. Which days are you not on? Uh, generally, it'll be Monday, Tuesday. We haven't really decided yet because. A lot of things are closed on Monday. We're considering being open on a Monday just so that there is other things open on Bowen. We don't have the staff to be open seven days a week. And so we're not planning on that. Okay. All right, can you Friday, Saturday, what are the hours? Uh, till 9 p.m. Thank you. Um, David, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I was going to ask the same question about the hours. But you wanted exceptions like for weddings or something like that? Yeah. So we, we would like to do special events. I mean, that, that is part of what we do. Um, so we'd like an exemption till 11. We originally had applied for midnight, which was the equivalent to the other local businesses that are similar to ours. We amended it for two reasons. One was because the local neighbors, there were some objections to the midnight opening. So we felt that it was fair to reduce it a little bit. The other was that we felt that we the closest business to us is the golf course. Uh, it's a large acreage, it's below a bunch of houses, has the same noise issue, basically the same function as we do, except that it's a golf course versus a farm. Um, and their, their hours are open till 11 p.m. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much. I'll put it. Thank you. Next, we have Rob Schleicher. So very good pronunciation, thank you. <laughs> yeah, how many people do we have on the list? We have 50 in total. Okay. Oh, yeah. Try to make it a little bit. I'll be fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd just like to address a, mis uh, a misapprehension a lot of people in the neighborhood have. Um, first of all, we, uh, my wife Michelle and I live at 1046 Grafton, which is down the street. Um, and uh, this is a mad couple to begin with. We're the ones who made all the noise in the summer. We had two weddings on our property. I have uh, written this letter by way of explanation and apology to my neighbors. So um, I'll read it out to you. To our neighbors, on July 23rd of this year, our daughter Camille married her childhood sweetheart, Jared, on our property at 1046 Grafton Road. This was our second family wedding of the year, the first on May 28th, the repeatedly COVID delayed wedding of our eldest daughter, Johanna, to her now husband, Ramon. On both nights, there was dancing and celebrating under the stars and into the night. And unfortunately, in the case of the second wedding in particular, in particular, there was also far too much application. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to an indoor, you know, an outdoor party, but you'll be at the dance floor and you'll think, oh, this is nice. And then you walk away from it and you go, oh, my God, it's too loud. And, uh, so throughout the evening, we were running back to the DJ and asking him to turn it down. And then a bunch of over exuberant wedding guests were turning it back up again, something that would have never happened in a controlled environment. This is a family wedding. So, on both that nights, there was dancing, celebrating under the stars and into the night. Unfortunately, in the case of the second wedding, there was also far too much amplification. Uh, our DJ was very proud of the uh, system he brought, and we were terrified of it. Uh, we we're truly sorry for the level of inconvenience and annoyance that it caused among our neighbors. Uh, we can describe hours of wrestling with an over a zealous DJ before cutting the power, but really, it's our fault. We're responsible. It's our fault. And we apologize for that. It's no excuse. But what's really disturbed us is that we've learned our actions have led to unintended consequences for another neighbor, Bowen, the Bowen Cider House. The idea of punishing responsible business that employs Bowen people and provides income for a long list of Bowen businesses for our irresponsible but unrelated behavior breaks my heart. This one's on us, not them. I encourage you, anyone who felt that way, to reconsider. We can't give you back a peaceful July 23rd. But let's not carry it forward. Uh, your actions against allowing responsibly managed indoor wedding receptions are instructive, and I'm sure that uh, everyone at Bowen uh, Cider House is probably correcting their course a little based on that. But let's not make it punitive to an innocent local business and employer just because we did this stupid thing and turned out the music we're willing. So, all right. Thank you for that, Robert. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Percy Johnson, and I'm here to ask you to approve the lounge endorsement for Minnesota House. Um, 
First of all, thanks to your own council outgoing that are, have done so much for their, um, Bowen. And a thanks in particular for delivering on the infrastructure projects. You've done it in times of change, really difficult times. And one of these changes that we see on Bowen is um, there's more people on Bowen. There's more people who are working here and there's more people who are spending their leisure time here. And that is pertinent to the asking for a lounge endorsement for Bowen Cider House. Um, some of the other changes that are trending changes are that people are much more interested in agricultural, uh, where their food comes from, um, where, how it's produced and how it's made, and they wanna be immersed in it, many more people. Um, we're also seeing that people want to eat and have drinks with friends closer to home. So Bowen Cider House, so they have a lounge endorsement, can offer that to all of the West Side um, residents. Um, who right now have to drive or cycle or whatever all the way to the cove. So this would give them something closer to home. They could cycle to it. As is being said, there's um, uh, power for e-cycles and um, they can meet their friends there, have a drink. They could also host meetings there, both business meetings and um, social gatherings, which I think is really important for the, as the island grows and develops. Um, they uh, also, I will say that um, uh, it is a working farm and you have to work hard on that farm, as I know very well, but it's really nice for all of Bowen and tourists to be able to see a working farm, to see the cider apples growing and see that made into the cider that they're drinking on the property. So I think that is really something nice that the um, uh, Bowen Cider House can offer. So I could go on and on, but you don't want me to. So I'll say, um, please uh, approve um, the lounge endorsement for Bowen Cider House. I think it's a great asset now, and it'll continue to be a growing and changing with the times asset for Bowen for uh, the foreseeable future. So thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Okay. Hi. Firstly, thanks to Mayor and Council um, for all your service to our community and thank you for the opportunity for Guest Council today. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of some of many of the 30 residents within the zone that signed the letter asking for, hang on, we're not ready for that. So um, I'm speaking on other people's behalf as well. Our Mid Island community may not be as familiar or as recognisable to council as Bowen Island uh, and Bowen, Bowen Islanders as Tunstall Bay or Deep Bay or Eagle Cliff. And many people might not realise that we're a neighbourhood at all and just think the areas of the Grafton Road, Adams Road Highway. But I'm here today to remind council that though we're very much a neighbourhood community, um, when we learned of the Cideries Business Expansion Plan in October, Many of us were shocked and surprised that no one had asked us about the suitability of the lounge endorsement. Then, in mid-October, some of us received letters from the municipality in the mail. Those were mailed on October 7th. Then, we were told that in less than two weeks, this impactful decision would be made today. We, and I suggest Council, have not had enough time to consider the impacts of this decision on our community. Our neighbourhood has welcomed the cidery and we've got no problems with the current small scale activity for the current owners. We're not anti-business or economic development. Our area currently includes Bowen Building Centre, the Garden Centre, Nectar Yoga, Wildwood Cottages, Alderwood Farm, the Dog Ranch, even the infamous Eddie's Pit. We do our bit to accommodate island business. However, now we're being asked to share the burden and impact of a new significant business model expansion that we feel is non-sustainable and will have detrimental effects to our rural, residential neighbourhood and lifestyle. We should not be the victims of this significant expanded economic development. We need more terms and conditions included in the endorsement and that's totally within Council's influence. What started as an apple orchard morphed into a cidery, then had a very large building and now has we thought plans for music and outdoor patio and a very large capacity and desires to become a full service tourist destination with the potential to gather a lot of people outside your business area, which is the cove. 
We do not support this. Our neighbourhood is very much already involved in economic development for Bowen Island, but we don't have a business name. Every household in our area is a business. You could call them family businesses. They include researchers, scientists, educators, artists, writers, spiritual practitioners, accountants, healthcare professionals. Our economic model often involves long and arduous use to support families, but based on an understanding that when at home and on island, they can enjoy a quiet rural lifestyle and the mental health benefits of that, and it's why we choose to live there. A healthy mix of both old and new residents in our neighbourhood signed the letter. If money talks, the last four families in our economic development model, just in the last 12 to 18 months, have invested almost five and a half million dollars in property, all paying valuable municipal taxes. No one told them that a neighbour down the road could be about to expand into a large wedding event destination and open long and late hours every day to allow drinking and music. This decision should not be based on empathy for an existing business owner whose current business model isn't generating enough income for them. We are all investors in our homes, in the well-being of our friends and neighbours, in businesses and on Bowen Island. Our sustainable economic development model is based on a long-term investment. Conservative estimates of those who signed the letter, $30 million worth of property investment. We're asking council not to support this business proposal just because the business exists and has potential for economic development. This is not a good enough reason to allow this significant expansion of activities to be imposed on our neighbours with so few rules and limits. As you're aware, while we had a pretty unanimous response concerning the lounge endorsement within the zone, it's worth noting that the few properties that were not inclined to object publicly are mostly either other non-taxpaying farmland designated properties, other business owners or potential cidery business suppliers. I would guess that they too have concerns regarding hours, capacity, music, noise and parking, and they may even welcome limits and restrictions. The recommendation before council does not reflect the community's concerns. We're asking council to refer to the LCRB referral evaluation criteria and allow further community input and consultation so that council can impose and enforce operating rules, capacity restrictions and undertake necessary noise analysis. A rush by the outgoing council to approve this application as it stands will not serve the needs of our rural residential community. The area's acoustics are that of a large amphitheatre. More land users equals more noise. More vehicles equals more noise. More weddings equals more noise. Outdoor music equals unacceptable noise. Our neighbourhood is asking for a fair and reasonable consideration so that we can continue to live in harmony with this local business and not be collateral damage based on a perception of island economic development. Please allow more time for the details, limitations and restrictions to be included before approving. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Any way to shorten it up a bit, we certainly appreciate it. Oh, well, I will make my effort. Thank you. Thank you. I ask. Good evening, Mayor Andrew and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to address Council with my concerns. Um, let me begin by um, stressing that my objections to the to the um, application for a lounge endorsement um, are specifically because of concerns about impact in our neighborhood. Prior to this application, um, I was very um, enthused about the presence of the cidery in our neighborhood. Over the years, I have observed various iterations of use on this property. Um, I've lived uh, on my property for 32 years. I live on Willie's Way. And I am, in fact, the property that would be most and immediately impacted by uh, any uh, additional noise or, or activity or commotion or disturbance of any kind that would be traveling up 
uphill. Um, over the time that I have lived uh, on Bowen Island, I have witnessed that this property has been uh, the home of a family homestead and shelter for a single mother raising her children. Um, after that, it was the delightful and neighbor-friendly Meadowbrook nursery that occupied that land. And then there was a period of puzzling hiatus, but soon enough it was clear that uh, there was an orchard and cidery emerging. And with that last version, I was encouraged by that notion that this would be yet another suitable, low impacting tenancy in the neighborhood. One whose intentions seemed a welcome addition to our local economy. And sadly, this is no longer the case. I'm alarmed by the nature of the proposed use and hours of the application by the Bowen Eiders, pardon me, the Bowen, the Bowen Cider House uh, application submitted to council. And I would like it noted that the lounge endorsement application is one that I cannot support for the following reasons and concerns. And I will try to be brief in summarizing. Um, notably, the hours as they were um, posted uh, through the Bowen Island municipality notice to the residents dated October the 7th. And I believe uh, on that document, they read as follows, 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. Friday to Sunday, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday to Thursday, outdoor lounge, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. With such hours and proposed capacity of 98 inside and 167 outside, which is a standard, by the way, determined by the um, Cider House's architectural design team. The latitude for loss of an enjoyment and erosion of well-being for residents in the neighborhood is of great concern. Um, noise will be cumulative with increased traffic, people gathering in large groups, amplified sound and possible additional noise of neighborhood dog barking as they are roused by this activity. The impact and seriousness of the latter is not to be underestimated. Our neighborhood is already plagued by this careening sound as barking dogs excite one another. As expressed by one of my neighbors, quote, this is not the place for big events, outdoor bands or amplified music, parties or loud gatherings going on into the night. Lots of us get up very early to go to work, close quote. Uh, I'll just try to move along. Um, I would like to note that we are in a special area. Uh, this Comparing this application to a venture such as the Bowen Island Club is erroneous. The two locations and character of surrounding neighborhoods are not the same. The Bowen Island Club is located in a commercial hub. The Bowen Cider House is not. Rather, it is a unique location that requires special consideration. The area functions as a land-based ear, a veritable amphitheater where sound is amplified and travels broadly, notably up Cowan Road, Willie's Way, along Adams Road and Grafton Road. The impact is in fact far-reaching. Furthermore, staff's recommendation to council is not appropriate. By their own admission, staff is neither equipped nor prepared to suitably advise council. And I quote, given staff do not have the resources or the expertise to conduct a noise analysis for this site and thus cannot provide council with accurate findings to reflect the sound levels in the subject area and ellipsis to a further um, inclusion in that document. To further address the noise level, Concerns Council may want to explore the idea of placing a condition for the adoption of noise control measures at the owner's expense if the municipality receives repeated noise complaints upon the opening of the lounge areas. Close quote. Now, here I would like to emphasize one of my major concerns. Placing the onus on local residents to lodge repeated complaints is a shifting of the responsibility of ensuring no harm on the part of both the applicants and the municipality. I would please like you to reflect on those very words. 
Instead, it becomes an onerous burden borne by irritated and beleaguered residents to lobby for effective remedial action by the municipality. This is an unacceptable and upside down approach. Respectfully, building commercial opportunities at the expense of the interests and well being of residents and property owners in the neighborhood is not suitable planning and management by our municipality. None of the business partners in this venture lives in this neighborhood. Their private homes, peace and quiet and well being are not at risk. Ours are. Um, I will move on to, to one further thing. I have I do have sober concerns about the timing and delivery of this application. The time accorded to concerned residents impacted by this proposal has been severely truncated. I first heard of this on October 4th when information was passed on to one of our concerned neighbors. My first advice to residents from the municipality was in a notice written on October the 7th, notice written by planner Natasha Chong. Some neighbors reported receiving this mail notice on October 12th. As of October 13th, there was nothing in my mailbox. I have not been phoned. I have not been e emailed. I have not been canvassed. Bearing in mind that the public hearing was scheduled for October 24th, this squeezed timeline strikes me as procedural carelessness. But that aside, why the rush? Why is our existing council pressing this through as last business? Clearly both Bowen Island Municipality and the Cider House have had ample time in considering and crafting intention and policy. While affected residents have been reeling and scampering to gather information, communicate with one another, consider implications and impacts, and hastily submit to council. None of this is desirable, and in fact, seeds suspicion and mistrust. I think I will. I respectfully ask council to consider the people of this neighborhood and make it a priority to safeguard our right to enjoyment of peace and quiet usage on our property. Our taxes rising yearly like those of the many residents on Bowen who are not threatened by such incursions on their rural lifestyle contribute to the commercial and community development projects in Snug Cove and areas specifically designated for such activities. Please keep the focus for such commercial impact where it is suitably zoned. I will end with a specific request. The council defer this application to the recently elected Bowen Island Municipal Council for more detailed consideration and thorough consultation with concerned neighbors. I thank you for your attention to my request and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next, Sophie. I'll be quick, but I'm going to take my glasses off so I can't see Gary going like this. Oh, my. Okay. There, there, there is a lot of business. To get yeah, I, I understand that. And um, and I don't even want to be honest. I'd rather not. Um, First of all, I, I do need to take this opportunity to thank Council for your service. I really do appreciate everything that you've done to step forward to represent the community. It's not always appreciated, so thank you. Um, as you know, my name is Cindy Keith. I've lived on the island nearly 30 years. 12 years ago, I moved to Bishop's Hill. It's a place where I can garden, grow fruits and vegetables, and be free from urbanized activities, including greater traffic and higher crime. It's also a place from where I've been working in my home office since the beginning of the pandemic. Residents of this mid-island location chose their investment because of its bucolic nature. <laughs> we are not within walking distance of commercial establishments. Uh, we do not have oceanfront or view properties. We have private wells and septic systems and a sometimes treacherous tertiary road. We don't ask for much from the municipality, yet we pay increasingly high taxes annually. 
What we do have is a peaceful rural neighborhood setting. Yet we hear the occasion, yes, we hear the occasional chainsaw or barking dog, sometimes more than occasional, but we are and wish to remain a quiet neighborhood bordering an ecological and an agricultural landscape. As neighbors, we are primary stakeholders to this application, and many of us are here this evening to register our opposition to this intrusion. While we appreciate there may be support for the application from other residents of the island, respectfully, they are not primary stakeholders. It is unreasonable to allow any business to operate in such a way that it interferes with the neighborhood's use and enjoyment of their land, regardless of how, how attractive it may be to others. Many of us were, as you've heard, quite blindsided by this proposal until a few short weeks ago. We have heard more recently that the applicants, from the applicants, that their request does not reflect their intent. In fact, the proprietor's own letter of support indicates, quote, it would not be our intent to remain open until 11 p.m. every night, but we are seeking flexibility for these types of bookings. For a wedding, for instance, it would be difficult to tell the guests they had to go indoors at 10 p.m., especially during the summer, end quote. You cannot grant approval for flexibility's sake and control what the proprietors do once they are entitled. Even to suggest that weddings or other events would amount to no more than 10 per year might seem reasonable, unless one were to appreciate that could mean weekly from mid-June to the end of August. Clearly, this would be the most attractive time of year for wedding parties to maximize the capacity with indoor and outdoor patrons during the warmer temperatures, which the proprietor's own comments allude to. Likewise, regular hours of operations to 10 or 11 p.m. seven days a week outdoors would deprive any resident in the vicinity of any quietude. We too would like to enjoy our summers and sit on our own decks in the solitude of our properties, enjoying the peaceful evening. We experienced the noise from the wedding party down the road from the cidery already this summer. It was completely unacceptable. Noise travels through this valley. It is also unreasonable to compare anything in this application to a thriving business within the commercial districts of Snug Cove or Artisan Square. These are very clearly commercial zones. Anyone moving into the area does so with full knowledge. I personally would never choose to live within earshot of the pub, and I didn't. Bowen Island Municipality Noise Control Bylaw Number 108 states that, quote, no person, owner, or occupier shall make, cause, or permit to be made or caused anywhere in the municipality any noise or sound which disturbs or tends to disturb the quiet, peace, rest, enjoyment, comfort, or convenience of the neighborhood or of persons in this vicinity, end quote. Objectionable or disturbing noise includes, quote, any sound made by the operation of a radio, stereophonic equipment, or other instrument or any apparatus for the production or amplification of sound slash music, end quote. I would add that anywhere 300 people are gathered and consuming alcohol, there will be objectionable noise. Whether there is amplified music or not, I ask you to consider if your neighbors had frequent parties next door. There is no place for this scale of an operation at Meadowbrook Corner. There is plenty of opportunity for a very welcome business model to exist within our current zoning. And perhaps this is something the incoming council can and should be involved in. I, for one, welcome something that adds attraction without the detraction of this current proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Margaret Underhill. Oh. I was going to read my letter, but I'm going to read one paragraph and just add a few more comments based on what I've been hearing tonight. Thank you, Margaret. Um, this is from my husband and myself. We sincerely hope that council and planning staff do their due diligence in reviewing and compiling the written submissions to ensure that letters from residents who have absolutely no possibility of being disturbed by noise from the cider house are not given the same weight as submissions from immediate neighbors of the cider house so that an accurate representation of resident feedback is provided to the LCRB. And it's, I feel I have to say something more just because I've been listening to people express exactly the same degree of distress, sickness, illness, mental health deterioration, as the residents of our neighborhood went through a little more than a year ago with the other cideries top application. It, same thing happened in Deep Bay, the Island Learning Center a year or so before that. 
And as we've seen the most recent one with Bowen Island Properties application for a TAP. And most of the problem is with municipal procedure. There's no, no requirement that applicant can consult their neighbors before going through the process of the municipality. And that applicants can spend weeks and months talking to municipal staff, planning staff, members of council, without ever breathing a word of it to their neighbors. And that only makes the whole process worse for everybody, including you guys who have to listen to it, and everybody that I've been hearing from here who have spent sleepless nights and been running around like crazy people trying to get this information together to talk to council. And it's wrong. And I continue, I'm going to continue pursuing this with the next council because it would be so easy to at least make the whole process more palatable. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, here. Uh, Rory McIntosh. Hi, Rory. Hello, people. Rory McIntosh. I live on the Sawmill Lane, uh, above uh, above where the the, the post siding will be. Um, it's yeah, it's the noise. If I had to pick one thing. It's it's the noise. Um, we did experience the, the the party last summer, and my goodness. Um, you know, windows closed, earplugs, and it was still too loud, even inside. Not okay. Um, and as other folks have pointed out, a uh, uh, couple, 300 people consuming alcohol, uh, music or not, it's going to be noisy. You know, we went outside last night on the deck at 9 o'clock, and uh, it was Friday night, and it was silent. You hear the occasional car going by, and it was lovely. Um, silence is, is precious. And... Um, I would hate to see that lost. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not in favor of particularly the large events uh, I'm, I'm concerned about. And I would ask council to uh, consider this application in, in over the course of over the course of time and not over the meeting tonight, but really to get a full understanding of all the impacts on, on all the bits. Um, it sounds like it was come through pretty quickly. I have no idea if you can do you know, water consumption analysis and septic analysis and, and impact on wildlife in that amount of time or not. Uh, but I, I'm concerned that it does seem to be going quickly and without enough consultation with the neighbors. But uh, I'll slip it up. Thank you, Ryan. I think this is Stefan. Hi. Um, I'm going to keep it brief to you just because I think a lot of the points have already been made. Uh, I'm a new resident here on Bowen. Uh, we purchased our house earlier in the year, um, and our house is just up the road from the cidery. Um, we looked at a lot of houses on Bowen, uh, a lot of different neighborhoods, and we were really attracted by this neighborhood based on what a lot of people have said already. It's rural, it's quiet, and it's a really great place to raise our two-year-old daughter. Um, we actually really like the cidery. We like Meadowbrook Market. We go there often. Um, we think it's a great business for our neighborhood. Um, we are concerned, though, about the hours, obviously, and the capacity. Um, anytime, like they said, you put together 150 people outdoors, 90 people indoors, um, drinking cider, you're going to have noise. And when you have a two-year-old who needs to go to bed at seven, eight o'clock, um, that becomes a big concern. And if that's every weekend of your summer, that's an even bigger concern. Um, this isn't about nimbyism. We're not worried about, you know, like not having them there. We want them to thrive because I want to be able to take my friends and my family down to their business um, and support them and be able to grab a, a bite to eat at six or seven o'clock. Um, but having a huge capacity of people there, extended hours, um, it's just cause for concern. And not only just the noise, there's a safety issue there too. How do people get to Meadowbrook and have, or to the cider house and how do they get home after the buses stop running? Everybody's driving. How many people are driving drunk? Um, and not only that, Applefest was a really good example of showing how their parking would facilitate a large capacity of people. Adams Road and um, sorry, I forget the name of the other road. Grafton were all the cars and it was single lane, lane driving. It was a little bit of chaos and it was very dangerous for people on bicycles, on foot or in their cars. So they have 24 spaces for 300 people. That doesn't seem right to me. 
Um, so yeah, I'm I'm in a opposition towards their current numbers. If they were to change that, I would fully support them. So thank you. All right, thank you, Ron. John so uh, I think we're in agreement. Everyone here has to make a living, and everyone wants peace and quiet in and around their home. I think we're in agreement on that. Um, and somehow we managed to make that happen, and and we've all made a significant sacrifice to do that here. When we talk about something long enough in a closed group, we start to believe what the closed group is saying. And then we try to make the group vision come true. And the problem with the vision of the Cidery for outdoor events with music is this vision was not shared with the neighborhood. I believe this is a radical proposal. It had no political mandate. It's critically missing engagement from the neighborhood and it defies the zoning of the area. So I'll talk about radical. If passed, you could say it's leveraging value from apples and trees that were grown. I would say that it's, it's really leveraging the local re residents' environment. It's monetizing a quiet, pristine setting in an extremely negatively impacting one that will remove the quality of life here for me and my neighbors, and undermine our, the values of our homes, period. I looked up nimbyism. I want to read this to you. But first, does anyone here think they could justify this project to their neighbors in their neighborhood? If not, then why support it? So here's the definition. And look, we all like this. We all get clustered around an idea and we're in a bubble. I'm in a bubble, it's the way it goes. But I think I just about deleted all my apps. <laughs> okay, this is the meaning of nimbyism. I looked up, what is the meaning of nimbyism? This is Cambridge English Dictionary. It's the behavior of someone who does not want someone to be built or done near where they live, although it does need to be built or done somewhere. There is no need for this. You'd be hard pressed to find anywhere in the GVRD with this proposed impact on a pre existing neighborhood. Even in built up areas, Commercial Drive, even downtown Vancouver, West End, no outside music except with one off licenses. Does anyone legitimately believe that not supporting it would thwart? the legitimate musical ambitions of young local musicians. That's one of the specious arguments of this, of this proposal. This proposal has a tenuous relationship to our agriculture. Apple trees, cider, live music with alcohol, including cider. What is the last step? This, this music, music with alcohol, including cider. What if the last step was cider making equipment manufacturing? Ask the residents of King Edward Bay. So as far as no political mandate, because it would be a radical change to the island, it requires a mandate for radical change. There is none. No one ran on this in the last election or in this, this one that just passed. Everybody, I mean, Gary, I mean, let me see here. So this is something from the undercurrent. In a, in a campaign characterized by candidates agreeing with one another, what do you feel is at stake in this election? Ultimately balancing the pressure of growth against preserving at all costs our natural peaceful island. The future of our quality of life is at stake. That's Gary in the undercurrent from October 8th, 2018. No mention of a cidery, but a strong endorsement for preserving the peace and quiet. Finally, critically missing engagement from the local community. I got this from the timeline on the, on the municipal website. I found out 
middle of October about this. So the, the proposal came in in April. Why didn't, why was that not made public? Why would, why was there no engagement? There was no, no email. There was no phone call. There was no canvassing at my house. We're there all the time. Um, September, October community engagement. Our, our letter came on the 13th. That was our community engagement. That's not community engagement. That's a letter. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, I keep it short. Yeah, sorry. Here's, here it is. And I said this in my, in my little letter, in my first thought, which was Paul Grant, which is adjacent to that property, used to have once a year, invite the whole neighborhood to play acoustic music inside a barn. You could hear the words at my house, which is way up the hill. And it was once a year, it was a one-off, it was a community thing. There was no commercial, you know, there was not hundreds of people there. It was loud and it was okay. This is not okay. This is not, this is radical and inappropriate. Please protect our neighborhood. Thank you, John. Um, we're just gonna move to the next person who is gonna speak with the to the cidery, and that would be uh, Mr. Michael Seidiker. That's me. Is that right? Yeah. Hi, I'm Michelle Glacier. It's new to the line. We've only been here almost two years. But yes, we are the ones with the noise, and I want to thank you for letting me speak today. Um, we live on the ALR, so we are just a few doors over, and we pay taxes. We are not a farm. It's for our family. We love the peace and quiet. Yes, we did make a mistake, and it did turn out that the DJ had a crush on the MC, so he brought this like Coachella-like amplification system. So that's something that would never happen anywhere, and we were shut down. I mean, it needed to be. It was too loud. But my neighbors who live near me, all seven of them, have all said unanimous support for the cidery. Um, yeah, all direct. So. One thing I want to say is that it's a family operation. It's something that's a nice place for everybody to go to. And for the future, families like us won't be having weddings on their property and inconveniencing all their neighbors all over Bowen. They have a place to go that's regulated and a wonderful place. So that's a great option. And I know there's many different um, points of view, but I really feel having been to the cidery, having been to the Apple Fest dinner, there was no noise outside. We had friends staying at our place and they said they were listening to the frogs, so they couldn't hear it at all. So um, I guess it's perspective or where you live and we are directly within that vicinity. So um, yeah, I think it's well run and if it can be managed by the council for the times that work and the ones that don't, I think it should be, we should be all for it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. My name is Anne-Claude Perrier. I live at 1425 West Side Road. So um, this is about my light motif. And the, to me, there is a major difference between the pub and the cider house. The pub is serviced by the Snuff Cove treatment plant, whereas the Bowen cider house is in a rural area. Before giving the final green light to a lounge, the municipality will have to confirm the planning, installation, and a septic system tailored and designed for a 125 meter indoor lounge, plus all the activities of the building in the outdoor lounge. And since it has been built to the capacity of the building code, it has to be, the septic system has to match that. And I also want to thank the outgoing council. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, so that wraps up uh, the speakers for the cidery. And uh, next, we have Bonnie Wright, if you'd like to speak about 1455. 
So I'm not talking about the at all. I'm talking about a, a building um, in on Thompson Boulevard, which is 1455. Um, I live beside it at 1459 Thompson Boulevard. Um, I've written back and forth with a few people, and I just kind of feel like I still have concerns that I'd like to bring up um, before this decision is made. I'm not sure that it's getting made immediately. Um, I remain concerned about the proposed changes that might have a negative effect on my property. Um, it may basically talking about a diversion of a stream. There are three streams um, that run close to this property and through this property. Um, the major concern is that stream two, um, they've asked to divert into stream three. Uh, stream three runs directly onto my property, under my driveway and along my driveway. Um, I um, So asking questions of the property, I, I've been told, and I know there's reports that say that the, that the stream three should be able to manage the amount of water that will be coming into onto my property. Um, and I was told that if, if I keep my culvert clean, then everything should be fine. This is something I've never had to have, have a second thought about with the amount of water that's there now. And I'm just a little bit concerned that the onus is now being put on me, that there's a lot of new water coming, but then that I'm going to be responsible for, for how it's flowing through my property. Um, I'm aware that there's been um, several properties in the area that were flooded last year. And the floods, of course, should not have technically occurred, um, but they did occur with at least three properties that are that are directly kind of involved in this in this water. And so there's also been flooding on white cells and reef roads. So I'm worried that adding another change to the surrounding water flow will have the potential to cause more problems than we've already had in a problematic area. Um, I would also like to address the fact that the owners, um, there's one, one letter that supports the changes. Um, however, the changes are going to directly benefit those people because it's taking water again away from their property and it's directing it to mine and the next two properties down from me. Um, another concern that's um, gone, that I haven't had an answer for yet is that there's a large amount of rocks that were placed at the point where stream two runs into stream one and stream one is uh, along Pumstow Boulevard, which runs like the ditch, but it's actually a waterway. Um, I, I believe that the municipality placed the rocks there years ago. I don't know the timeline. I'd love to find out the timeline. And when I go and look at that spot, there's a large amount of erosion that happened. And I believe like the water was just gushing out of there years ago. And I think the municipality placed them there in order to help with that problem. Um, however, now all the stuff that I'm seeing says that, that this stream too is just a recent small stream that has um, happened only because of debris. And, and I, I think this is quite contrary to that because the municipality is done work to deal with that water. So again, I'm concerned about that much water coming onto my property. Um, and next thing would be that there's a, um, a riparian report and there's a couple of factual errors in that report. One that the pond, um, that some of this water flows through and down is on my property, which it's not. And the second, oh, the second thing was that they said that this, the, that report says that the stream three capacity was not um, looked at because they weren't allowed onto my property. And I wasn't, I wasn't asked for that. And I'm just not sure um, how they can suggest that these changes happen if, if those people haven't looked at that capacity. Um, so then in conclusion, I just said that my, uh, the new property um, was purchased with the knowledge that there were these water problems on it. And I'm just concerned that um, if this is passing on the water problem, they're, they're happy to divert the water, but there's, there's properties downstream that may have problems in the future. Um, and then, I, I, you know, my main, main question that I haven't had answered also is that if there are problems on my property or two lower properties further down, it, who, who is responsible if there's a problem, if there's a flood, if part of my driveway collapses or if something like that happens, I, I'd like to know who's responsible for, for those because, you know, I'm not making the changes, however, the water will affect me. And so I'd like to know if municipality or the owners or who would who would take responsibility for that. 
Understandable. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Shannon Bentley. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Council. Thank you for your work. Um, and I'd like to thank staff, especially I'm going to play Daniel because he took time with me last week to listen to a lot of my concerns and was very patient. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> um, first of all, I know you've had over 500 pages of materials. Over the weekend, I am aware of at least four letters concerning this topic that and that it, some included videos of the waterways in question, and I don't know if you've had a chance to see yeah. those. Okay, I just wanted to flag it because <laughs> it's important. <clears throat> um, I've lived in Huntsville for over 20 years, and um, I'm concerned, I watched your September meeting on Zoom, thank you for doing Zoom, and um, I'm here and wrote a letter because I'm concerned about a couple of issues with this application. First, and I'll keep within two minutes. Um, the context, this, the subject property has never been developed. It's ever since Tunstall uh, subdivision was created, this is a, a lot that's never been developed. Indeed, the one beside it had never been developed. Both were sold during COVID. Uh, the subject property is wholly within the Explosives Creek riparian area, wholly. Uh, the subject property is traversed by multiple streams that split and regroup. The, uh, the plans suggest that there's three streams, but they do fork and regroup. I'll still refer to them as three, though there, there's more. All streams feed into Explosives Creek. Um, Explosives Creek, in case anyone didn't know, and I just realized this, is one of the last two remaining fish bearing streams on bow. Coho and chum salmon are released in there annually. So um, because of that and this lot, there's provincial regulations plus municipal bylaws that, that protect those streams fish because of what I just said. And um, to do that, they establish setbacks. Well, the setbacks, when taken together, cover so much of this property that there is no buildable area possible. I think that's why it's never sold, um, even in the old days when the setbacks were small. So that's just a bit of context. And I think that's important to, to get your head around it, as it was for me. So um, after watching the September meeting, I wanted to flag three issues that I think are important to consider. Um, one is a reduction of the front setback and a reduction of the stream one setback, which is the subject of this variance application. The second issue, and I'll come back and talk a little bit more about it. The second issue is the complete diversion of the stream two that Bonnie was speaking of into neighboring properties, into stream three, which then, you know, tunnels like this, that will have a so-called cascading effect to the town of the property. I'll come back and talk about that. And then the final one, which it's challenging because it may not be, um, well, the, the, fine, the third issue is that Tunstall neighborhood has had a large scale unresolved water flooding issues not just last year when many people had it and it was an exceptional year, but but prior to that, last year just took it out off the charts. Um, and I'll discuss that a little bit more. So let me come back to the specific variance in question. Um, stream one runs parallel to Tunstall Boulevard. It is a stream. Some people call it a ditch, but it's a stream that feeds into Explosives Creek. And I don't think we have any question about that. The setback that they want reduced is to bump the property closer to the road allowance, which will then also pinch stream one, which is in between the road allowance and the subject property by half. There's, I believe that's an issue that we need to really think about. Additionally, on, the, on, their, um, on their plans, the septic, 
is to be placed the field back further, but septic still is flanked for within that reduced setback area. And I don't know septic technology, but I'm happy the field's not there, but there's still septic related things, which I don't think septic has any place being anywhere near a fish bearing tributary, a tributary to a fish bearing stream. Oh, sorry, that's fine. Oh, shoot. Okay, I'll be. I'll wrap up really fast. Um, the diversion into the downhill properties is a concern because there has been no assessment of the impact implications of that. No assessment of the stream three's ability to cope, whether the infrastructure can cope. Um, there hasn't been any notification to 1463 tons of Boulevard that I'm aware of let alone consent. Um, and I'll jump to the third issue, uh, and that's this large-scale unresolved watering, water flooding. Uh, my neighbors, all but one, have experienced basement flooding, driveways washed out, water percolating through manhole covers on Tunstall Boulevard, and then free-flowing water where there hasn't been any before. I think um, I don't know how council can consider approving these variances, with, including the, the stream two, um, when causes and likely future damage, liability maybe as well, for these broader water flow and flooding hazards, when they haven't been addressed or resolved, well, they're trying to be addressed, but they're not resolved yet. So if the big picture is a bit of a mess, how can we start tinkering with these smaller pieces? So um, my final point is that I understand the applicants applying for um, a narrow hardship exemption under the laws, which is there. But while I empathize with the, the owner of the subject property, I can't help but wonder, why would you choose to purchase such a compromised lot, knowing full well that the current laws prevent development? Um, I. I, the hardship wasn't imposed after his purchase. They were there all along. So he really voluntarily stepped into the situation. Up and up, yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Amy Adams and Amy is on Zoom. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and Council. Thank you very much for the opportunity to briefly address you tonight. Uh, you know, we've heard of these concerns from the neighbors, and I've worked very hard over the last couple of weeks to uh, write a synopsis of all the reports to try to make sense uh, for the layman, all of the engineering that goes into what we've been doing for uh, over a year now. So my client bought this property, and he bought it after consultation with the Bonal Municipality uh, and the Planning Department, and we had theoretical um, support if we could make sure that the provincial uh, authorities were satisfied with our, our analysis and our proposal. So, so we actually just this past week got informal approval from Rapper, which is a really huge deal. They're the ones that deal with all the SPIAs and the stream setbacks. Um, as you know, there are three different streams on this site and there's only 25 square foot of developable area that is outside those setbacks. So basically, um, the province is not allowed to render this site sterile, which is unbuildable. So we have, uh, you know, collaborated to great lengths to try to come up with the most responsible solution to creating a home here. Um, you know, it, it, it's unfortunately it was developed the way it was. As Daniel said in his report, it wouldn't be done that that way these days. Uh, you know, but I, I think we've we've done the best we can to make sure that we are being responsible and thorough and, you know, in light of bringing the engineer in here to explain the hydrology report that he did for stream three, which did come out to the, to the conclusion that the capacity is there, even in a hundred year storm, which is most likely what we had last, last year. So it has been tested to the full capacity and we're confident in our qualified professionals and their opinions and assessments. And, and that's what we need to rely on for these types of projects. So. Thank you very much for this time. And uh, our QEP, McKaylee, is here as well. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Okay. Oh, she's there, too. Yeah, there she is. 
Yeah, hi. <laughs> I wanted to take the opportunity to thank mayor and council for the last four years of service. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm an environmental consultant that has a business license to operate here on Bowen. And I've been retained by the property owner at 1455 Tunstall. Uh, to prepare an environmental assessment as well as the riparian areas protection regulation detailed assessment um, for the development permit for this property. And um, um, a couple of points that I needed to address is that the stream three capacity is not addressed in a wrapper assessment. The wrapper assessment only addresses the features, functions, and conditions of the stream as they relate to fish or fish habitat. So it's not my job to address capacity, but knowing that there was issues with water on adjacent parcels, that's when I recommended to the uh, property owner that they needed to get an engineer on board. And so Dr. Ramsey conducted the hydrological analysis of stream three and determined that diverting stream two into stream three would have the capacity. And the other point that I wanted to make is that the undue hardship clause under the riparian areas protection regulation actually provides an exemption to the setbacks that are laid out in the riparian areas protection regulation. So it's up to the QEP to um, demonstrate that undue hardship applies to the lot. And um, I was able to demonstrate that to the province. And so uh, we have an informal approval from them at this point. Uh, we're waiting for Charlotte to come back from being in the field to finish her final um, formal approval. That it, Mikhail? Yes, um, I'm available if there's any questions that come out of the uh, additional information from Daniel. All right, thank you very much, Michaela. Appreciate that. That's the end of the public comments list. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sophie. Uh, anybody else want to speak? I will keep it brief. I really feel like there's been this It makes me really sad that the neighbors who felt that they this is who you are. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, Jeanette Langman from Bowen Cider House, married to Allison. Um, we are a family run operation. Um, I get where the neighbors are coming from. They feel they weren't consulted, but I am shocked at the response that nobody ever came to talk to us. We put a, a letter to the editor in the paper. We tried to go door to door, and I will say that. My husband went up um, Bishop's Hill. Nobody would answer their door. People were home. People, he could see them inside. We tried to contact them. We, we heard that there was an email going around. And one of the people who was very, you know, in favor of our land application, and um, they offered to send a letter around um, offering to meet with people. We did not have one person contact us. We did not have anybody show up to a proposed meeting yesterday. We were really sad. We were looking forward to hearing about you know everyone's concerns and nobody showed up. We wanted to discuss a good neighbor agreement and um, everyone says you know they chose this for a quiet reason to live in this area. We completely agree we're the same. We we're a couple, we're a family, we don't want to run a pub, we never planned on that. We want to run a quiet establishment. We've never had one complaint. Um, our current manufacturing facility is on AOR land, which has this specified allowed use, of which operating a cider incurring and including ancillary uses, such as operating a picnic area and a food and beverage service lounge, is a prescribed and promoted farm use. This is all online. When you bought the properties, speak to us. Sorry, when when they bought the properties, they they bought the side ALR land, and it's all online. Everything that's you're allowed to do on ALR, uh, ALR land is written up online. It's super easy to Google. Um, and but you know more like what would this look like? They think that we want to have a big parties every night. That's not at all what this looks like. Our picnic area has been open for months and it just, it's just people sitting outside instead of inside. And, you know, here we come coming up to the winter and we can only sell bottle, bottle 
uh, decided by the bottle. And people can take it out into our picnic area in the freezing cold and drink it up there. But we can't monitor them. You know, they can sit up there, drink a whole bottle and leave. And it's just not, a, to me, a responsible way of running a salary. We want to be able to serve people and serve them food and monitor what's going on. That's our idea of this. And I'm sorry that our friends, who happen to be our friends, that we bring our kids grew up together in North Van, and they had a party. And now we all know how awful that can be. But we have never had a noise complaint ever. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to make a few points saying because I totally understand that people can get upset. There are no plans for loud music or effort by the concerts. We have had weddings, we've had no complaints. Um, and we want to keep it that way. We love our community. Um, I think that, that we, we had overwhelmingly positive response to our application. We've already said that, including many businesses who would be our competition, like like the golf course and the liquor store, you know, like, like, so I understand what people are saying, but I don't think they have given us the opportunity to have the conversation to side. So I'm asking you to really have a look at this. It is a prescribed use. Um, and we would really appreciate your support. Thank you. Now I'm going to take one if I can just say one quick thing. Um, okay. It's quick. It, it's very quick. Um, I, I know that the residents think that this could be loud, noisy occupation and that they've never been consulted and that there's no indication that we would be doing anything like this. I want everybody to understand that the property, Meadowbrook Corner, has been a commercially zoned property since 1970. So it's always been commercially zoned. It has a, a specific kind of zoning, which is commercial agricultural. That came in when John McLeod had the property, when he put it was putting in the, the nursery, but it has always been commercially zoned from 1970. So this isn't a new thing. This is that zoning has been there for a long, long, long time. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. I'm so sorry to keep you. No. Ellen McIntosh, I don't want Solomon Lane. Yeah. We were not consulted. I don't think I've ever met you. Nice to meet you. We, um, there's a whole bunch of people that didn't know. And that, um, that's too bad because here we are. And uh, I think it's encouraging to me. I was really mad when I heard about it because I found out about it a week ago. And I work full time and I commute. And, you know, it was really like, are you kidding? So anyway, here we are. I'm hearing more about it. I'm learning more about it. Happy to learn more about it. I think all of us are. None of us want to see the cidery uh, fail. Everybody wants to see our neighbors do well. And uh, it's too fast. You're, it's going too fast. There's not enough time to absorb the information. There's not a enough time to come to consensus as a community of stakeholders who live in the area on what the restrictions should be and what would be acceptable to all players, to the cidery and to the people who work there. And I don't think there's any hostility around the opportunity to do that. Where, where there is hostility and anger is around it being shoved down your throat tonight. So yes. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna move on. Quickly. Okay, so um, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Does anybody have anything in there that they want some clarification on? Yeah. Everything okay? Good. Okay, we will have the recommendation as the council approve the items as outlined in the October 24th consent agenda, and we will approve that by consensus. Move on to delegations. Presentation of Island Trust Community Stewardship Award to Will Husby. I think Peter, Peter's online here. Yeah, no. Oh, really? Um, so we have the, yes, we have certainly the, do. We have Will? Yeah, Will is everywhere. Okay.
Welcome to you. Yeah. Well, you, you, you don't have to. I, I'm holding as a, as a member of the Islands Trust, just about to leave the Islands Trust, by the way. But as for one of my final duties, probably my final duty, is to present Will Hunsbury this, this uh, lovely stewardship award. I frankly can't think of anybody, Will, who deserves it more than yourself. I think that is echoed by you know, everyone in the room. And I have to tell you, uh, Mr. Turner thoroughly stole my thunder. He must have read your entire CV, amplified it, turned it inside out, and, and, and articulated it very well. But everything that he said, his presentation was right. Thank you for being such a great friend for the islands. Will, Will has headed up committees. He's just been an exemplary citizen. He is so knowledgeable. He's the only person I know that my wife can send a photograph of this peculiar bug she found <laughs> on the plant. And I said, oh, Will might know. And of course, guess what? Will do. And it gave us a wonderful rendition of exactly what it was, in part of it, in words we could understand. Will, <laughs> take hands. Thank you on behalf of Council. Thank you on behalf of everybody involved, everybody on Bowen Island. I'm very proud to present this certificate to you. It's richly deserved, and please accept it. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. But one final thing I'm going to say is thanks to Council and Mayor and staff for what you've done in the last four years. Um, it's been inspirational. It's uh, been, uh, it's made people like me want to do the things that, that I do. So thank you. Thank you. Right, and then we're going to move on to uh, the Bullet Island Museum Archives Annual Report. Wow. Rob Forrest, come on down. Yeah. In, in light of the, uh, my name's Rob Forrest, I'm the president of the Museum and Archives. I don't think we have to introduce our organization to the, uh, the council or the mayor. I think you're both uh, advised in who we are. Um, in, Basically, I'm going to catch the it's the last time I was here about four, four years ago. I was you guys accused me of being a bit long winded, so I'll make it short because we're <laughs> we're uh, on schedule here considerably. Um, today, the, the Bowen Island Museum and Archives is one of the few nonprofit organizations on the island um, that has receives core funding. Uh, this uh, four year agreement has expired, so. Um, Basically, I would like to renew this agreement for another four years. And 100% of all our funds uh, received go to towards staffing costs. We have one part-time archivist and one part-time museum curator for a total of three, 33 hours per week. We're requesting an increase in our funding uh, over the next year and subsequent years to increase our staff hours to 50 hours per week, provide more accessibility to, for the public to view our exhibits. And, and also addressing our increased research requests. Um, we've taken on some, also we've taken on some major projects in the last year, digitization, digitization of the archival fonts, new book, History of Bowen Island, we've just started with our research as well as interviews, and the rebuilding of our new website. Again, these are major projects, we just have to have the time. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'd like to, as you can see here, our, our funding proposal. Uh, I've attached our EGM reports and financial records as well for your full review. But that's it. And I also want to thank all of you for your service over the last four years. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Everybody's got the report. I know we haven't had time to get through it, but anybody have any questions for me? Yes. I'm really excited to see the book project. Yes. And I think that Chuck Davis' book as a model is, is adequate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. It's, it's needed. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Very concise. And yes, indeed. I'll get through it. <laughs> yeah.
Okay, so we're going to move on to business and rising for eight minutes. Uh, 6.1 is committee's review report. Councilors Maureen Nicholson and Michael Gale. I think that we can probably make this quite brief. I think we can make it extremely brief. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We have the final uh, version of the report on the um, municipal committees. We, Michael and I have been working on this for some time. We met with our chair and vice chair of the municipal committees on October the 7th to go through the report and get feedback on uh, what we were recommending. Um, on page 10 of the report, there are um, five recommendations for the recommendation, the second to the fifth are generally supported by the committee chairs, and we didn't ask them on the recommendation on the first one. So the um, recommendation that we have here is simply that council receive the final committee's review report and survey responses for information and recommend review and further action by the incoming council. Could I get a second? Also. Hey, any uh, further to Michael, have you got any? Well, as a, 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 a reports of this magnitude, it will take them this long. Um, this is not the forum to go through it. It does come with concise and precise recommendations. And obviously, it uh, hopefully will act as guidelines for the incoming council because uh, it's for them to take this up. And I think when we were considerably through this project, we realized. It was of a magnitude where we were unlikely to come to a conclusion. However, hopefully it will be a very helpful resource document for the next for the next group of councillors and there. Absolutely. It's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing compilation of of uh, of the because we do have a lot of committees. There's absolutely no question about that. I think you guys laid it out further. We did have a full discussion on it. And I, I believe the recommendations should go on to the next council to see what they're going to say. David, I just want to thank Maureen and Michael. Yeah. I thought when you started out, I thought, my God, this is a lot of work. And, and it wasn't easy. Um, and I recognize that number one is the, it's the trickiest one, but the other recommendations that really comes down to better alignment between council and volunteers so that we're really using our volunteer group to help us achieve or to help the new council achieve the kinds of things they set out to do. So really appreciate that. And I think I think the, the new council will welcome it. Thanks. Yeah, I hope so. So um yeah thank you you guys for all your work. Uh Councillor Kale and Councillor Nicholson, not you guys. <laughs> um I uh I think I'm looking forward to going through this work with the new council. Um partly because I think it'll be a good Backgrounder for them to really get a sense of the kind of community engagement and volunteering and expertise that comes from the community. You've got this rich participatory culture, uh, which we've seen some of uh, tonight with the input that we've received and um, perhaps with communication. And uh, what I think most um, municipalities would love to have our rural turnout or the kinds of people that come out, um, the numbers of people that turn out for events like Remembrance Day, I think that's all part of the same. And uh, so, you know, I'm not looking to make big cuts, but I'm happy for the recommendations that you've made and the work that you've put into the report. And uh, I think, um, thank you very much for that. As the new council sets their priorities, I think it'd be really helpful. Mm -hmm. After the discussion um, with the uh, chairs and vice chairs, um, there were two things I had and to the group as having not come up in the discussion. The first was the cost of maintaining the current structure that just was not on people's radar. And the second was the um, limitations that the committee structure could um, impose for some members of the community. And, and the, the notion that came up in an earlier report on Metro Parks, looking to um, what they were calling episodic um, engagement. Um, that episodic engagement, you know, the, the one off opportunities to be involved in municipal matters could help to broaden the um, engagement of more members of our community because a, a committee commitment is a big time commitment. 
whereas something that is smaller or more focused um, might be better for, um, for folks in the community who just want to get a taste of, um, of involvement rather than committing to three or three years on a municipal committee. So those two things, the, the cost of maintaining the current um, structure in terms of real cost, but also in terms of volunteer cost you know, and broadening the you know, potential for different kinds of um, volunteer participation in municipal matters. Those were two things that we kind of ended the evening with. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion on that? Hello? Yeah, I'll just make a quick call to it. And, and thanks for both the work of Councillor uh, Hale and, and Lucasum. Um, I was at the meeting and it was a couple of things that stood out for me. The episodic one that uh, Lorraine just brought up, I think is a really good point. And I think we need to look at that and not just create committees, but if we have specific issues, be a bit more targeted with, with that. I think that's a really good that came out of that meeting. Also, what really stood out for me was the diversity in how committees are operated and the sort of one size fits all will not go very well with our committee. Yeah. There's some that actually felt there was a great job being done, some that did not feel it was a good job being done, and also the different levels that they work at. So I think that's something that is going to be a challenge for staff. Briefly, this idea that we can have all committees sort of operating the same. I think it was pretty quickly seen that that's not going to be uh, something moving forward in the future because each one has sort of the unique ways of working and also unique mandates to council uh, that that are going to be different with each committee moving forward. So I think this, this is a great sort of framework to move forward with. And uh, I think what started off with a, hey, let's try to reduce the amount of committees became... <laughs> That isn't easy and, and, and the work there. The other, just the last thing that I think was, uh, came out of recommendation too was a bit of a yearly get together of chairs and vice chairs because there, there is a disconnect between committees so that we can see where committees are working well, where they're not working well, and we see that up front instead of sort of gearing it through back channels and whatnot. So that's Thanks, Rob. Seems to be a bit of a wrap there. So I'll ask a question all in favor. Yeah. Okay, that is unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll move on to uh, bylaws. Your memory is not called sewer establishment bylaw, and that's over to Councillor Moore. This is up for fourth reading, and you'll notice in the very short report that they have been reviewed by the CAO. Um, and this is to turn the Snug Cove sewer establishment bylaw not changing the area, just making it an advisory committee rather than a management. And that's a request from the sewer advisory committee, the sewer committee themselves. So the motion is that Snug Coast Sewer Specified Area and Local Management Committee Purpose and Establishment Bylaw Number 10, 2000 Amendment Bylaw Number 591-22 be reconsidered and finally adopted. Second that. Thank you, Michael. Okay, uh, questions? So, I'm just uh, thank you, CAO, for reviewing those. I was just really wanted to have another pair of eyes on it. And I have a brief question, and that's Did you hear any more from the. Uh, did you hear any more from the committee? Is what I, my question was going to be. I, as the water, this, this bylaw is a request of the sewer committee. Right, right. Okay, sorry, I'm in the wrong one. Okay, thank you. Is that it, Sue? Yep. Okay, I'll ask a question. All in favor? It was unanimous. Thank you. And we'll move on to the amendments to the water system establishment bylaws, Councilor Morris. This is um, to correct an error in the um, two bylaws, one each water bylaw and one bylaw that establishes all the water committees both did the same thing. So to remove confusion um, and keep things simple, the water system bylaws themselves are being amended to remove the redundant clause. And no change to any of the, anything about operations or anything. And again, you will see from the report that it has been reviewed by the CAO. And um, also uh, the receipt of it has been acknowledged, but there's been no more by some of the water committee members, but there's been no question. Okay, thank you, Allison. Uh, any so I will make the motion 
Okay. The bio number 589-2022 cited as Blue Water Park Water System Specified Area Establishment Bylaw Number 82-2003 Amendment Bylaw Number 589-2022 be adopted. The bylaw number 588-2022 cited as this Bowen Bay Water System Specified Area Establishment Bylaw Number 78-2002 Amendment Bylaw Number 588-2022 be adopted. The bylaw number 590-2022 cited the water system specified area establishment bylaw number 79-2002 amendment bylaw number 590-2022 be adopted. The bylaw number 587-2022 cited as foot point water system specified area establishment bylaw number 83-2003 amendment bylaw number 587-2022 be adopted. And that bylaw number 586-2022 cited as Tunstall Bay Water System specified areas, establishment bylaw number 80. Oh, there's a small, no, no, 80, 2002. Amendment bylaw number 586-2022 be adopted. Okay. I make that motion. I'll second that. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. And that is unanimous. It's carried. Okay, so we'll move down to staff reports. And the first one is a crown line referral, uh, referral at 270 Smugglers Cove Road, private mortgage facility. Drew back at Planner One. Drew around, I guess. We're there. Hi, Drew. Welcome. Hi, Drew. Hi, Drew. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So, Bowen Island Municipality received a Crown Land Referral from the Ministry of Forests, Lands, Natural Resource Operations, and Rural Developments on June 3rd, 2022. The request to the province is to allow proposed tenure for a private mortgage facility. An environmental assessment report was provided, which identifies possible environmental risks from the proposed construction activities and recommends mitigation measures to lessen the likelihood or degree of those impacts. The proposed dock and float will be constructed at 270 Smugglers Cove Road, which is located near the northeast tip of the island. The property at 270 Smugglers Cove Road is under a CD4 Area 1 zoning, while the area north of the property where the dock itself will be constructed is a WG1 water use zone, uh, which permits private mortgage facilities. The site plan and section plan display the proposed structure itself, which will comply with all zoning requirements pertaining to the the water use zone within the land use bylaw. Uh, the survey of the substrate and proposed construction area shows that the area consists almost entirely of rocks and boulders. Uh, the request was initially presented at Council's regular meeting on October 11th, 2022, where Council voted to defer their decision until today so a, a site visit could be carried out. A site visit of the beach area was done by Council on October 21st, 2022. Alternatives to Council's approval of the request include the following. One, the council direct staff to indicate to the ministry that Bowen Island municipality objects to the tenure application. Two, the council direct staff to include specific comment regarding uh, Crown Land Referral 01 2022 to the ministry. Three, the council refers the referral to staff for additional comments or for other implications as identified by council. Finally, the staff recommendation to council is that council makes no objection to the application to Crown Land Referral 01 2022 provided that the environmental mitigation measures recommended in the overview environmental impact assessment prepared by PGL environmental consultants dated August 24, 2022 are followed. All right, Andrew, thank you, You're perfect. Um, so hello. Thanks, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, thanks for leading that walkabout on Friday, I think it was. Sure. And um, uh, my questions are, oh, I'll do them one at a time if you don't mind, I've got uh, two, here we go. Um, Number one, uh, the bylaw, um, I'm looking at uh, page 94 of 557, and the second bullet there shows that eelgrass was found in the diving trans transect, and uh, and yet I don't see anything about uh, uh, how, how do we know that the eelgrass, if it, that it's present, how will it not be impacted? Uh, so they get pretty specific on their... Uh, on and their assessment and their transects of where they got that info and, and we did as well. Uh, those were there, there was some back and forth between Bonnie uh um Broken Sharp when she was still here. Um kind of threw myself down to, to the um 
to the PGL environmental consultants. Um, trying to remember specifics on that day. Yeah, Bonnie, Bonnie had raised some concerns just asking, yeah, if, if there were any mitigation measures, anything like that. And they basically, they felt that uh, the patches were far enough away from the structure itself. They, they, they felt confident in saying there would be no impacts to it. Okay. Uh, thanks. I did look at um, uh, bull map has the eelgrass patches there, and it does look okay, like it's off to one side. I'm wondering if uh, usually we used to get the um, did we see that report as council? Was it in the earlier agenda or something? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. Right. Thank you. I just didn't have that that direction. Okay. Thank you. My second question is, um, I don't see anything in the uh, report. Maybe I missed it about. Um, the, the distance between this dock and that big group dock that is in the center of the bay, and it doesn't show up on any of these impacts, but I obviously took a photo and ducked underneath it when we were there on site. Um, the piling are quite a ways out, and if you look at the, the third last photo in the report, uh, the one with the finger pointing, you can, this one, you can see the, um, Piling there to the right. Is it was the measurements done about to make sure that the distance is going to be far enough away? Because I see all the floats have been pulled in. Like there's six floats all pulled in against the close pilings, but I don't see anything in the report about the distance between the docks. Okay, that is part of what we that is part of our review. Um, that there's that and a number of other requirements, just to catch some length of dock, uh, minimum height of dock, that kind of thing. So yeah, I don't go through those. Um, regulations individually in the report, but all those have been uh, we looked at them all. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. We're through. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go ahead. Um, I'm just uh, um, I'm thinking about the uh, ongoing issue to me of privatizing the public shoreline, <laughs> and to me that's a common area for uh, the public and for wildlife and wild creatures, obviously. And it's not private land, so um, it's also uh, people in the future that may want to come down those two beach accesses. If you put that map up again, um, at some point, one of those beach accesses may be developed. And uh, I just um, and there's First Nations too. Now we have uh, the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and the uh, provincial regulations about. Um, how to take that into um, anyway? I think I think there's a lot of people and wildlife and nature with interest down there, including kayakers and boaters and um, swimmers and all kinds of people who use the water and the shoreline and who look at the views and um, and who and the future people and children who may want to play on the beach. And uh, so I'm just wondering how do we? Did you have a sense of? taking in the cumulative impact of docks through time and um, impacts on people who aren't there yet. That's your recommendation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Answering my own question. Thank you. I just <laughs> wanted to say those things. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any comments on this? Okay. Um, just looking at the photos and having been there on the uh, walkabout, there's, there's no way anybody's going to be even at low tide walking around that and it's well high enough and it's nowhere near the beach from a physical perspective. That's quite a um, Okay, um, I will move uh, the recommendation as you see on the screen on there. Second, thank you, David. And uh, any further discussion? No, so I'll ask a question all in favor. Aye, opposed? Okay, Councillor uh, Fast in opposition. Thank you. Passes, and we go on to 8.2, Bowen Cider House Lounge Area Endorsement Application. Tasha Chone, Island Community Planner. There she is. Hi, Natasha. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. We'll have to do that then. All right, I will share my screen here. All right, sound okay? You can see the screen? Yes, thank you. Great. 
So thank you, Mayor Ander, and good evening, Council. As mentioned, I'll be presenting uh, on the consideration of the Bone Cider House's liquor referral lounge endorsement area application. So given the nature of this particular application, uh, before we get into the written submissions discussion, I wanted to briefly go over the application along with its regulations that it's adhered, adhering to. So uh, 1125 Grafton Road is zoned Rural Commercial 1 in Bowen Island's land use bylaw, and it's provincially zoned as Agricultural Land Reserve. So as a reminder, cider use is not permitted within BAM's land use bylaw, but given its provincially designation or prov provincially zoned ALR, cidery is a permitted farm. Um, and so this application is moving forward for consideration. And for clarification, their lounge endorsement area is permitted under the manufacturing license. So this allows for the production of cider along with other things like having a dedicated sampling area for the public, provided tours and sell their products. Again, the lounge endorsement area is permitted, as I mentioned, under the ALR. Um, and so they must comply with the ALR use regulations along with the LCRB, so the Liquor and Cannabis uh, Re uh, Regulation Board's manufacturing licenses, terms, and conditions. And so within the uh, ALR regulations, there is this uh, size limit, so 125 square meters for the indoor and outdoor lounge. Um, within the ALR use regulations, there is no uh, capacity limit. And so the LCRB bases their capacity limit on the occupancy load. For reference, here's the site plan. And here are some photos from the site visit. And again, the uh, capacity request. So the applicant is requesting 98 people for the uh, indoor lounge and a occupancy load of 167 individuals for the outdoor lounge. Now, regarding the hours, uh, it does appear that the owners of Bone Cider House have made changes and are now requesting different hours, which staff can support. Um, staff had initially made a recommendation for later hours to accommodate certain events, such as weddings, which was communicated to staff and council in a letter from the applicant. Now onto the referral criteria. As a reminder, staff advised council to consider the application based on public input. So location of establishment, noise on nearby residents, and to consider the capacity and parking restrictions. Um, I will note that the parking requirements have been updated to 24 spaces, inclusive of one parking space for people with disabilities, uh, which seems to be in compliance as mentioned by the applicant. Uh, they currently have 27 parking spaces in total. So onto the written submissions. Staff have received comments from 23 households with three in support mm -hmm. and 21 having concerns. So I should mention this is the 300 meter buffer. Um, and so they were provided the mail out. Um, now there was a group, the one group letter that consisted of the 31 respondents along with 10 individual letters. I'll note that the comments received from the individual letters are the same individuals within the group letter of 31 residents. And so their main concerns pertain to issues such as noise, so the parking and capacity, along with the hours of operation. And so as you can see with the map, the blue circles represent the individuals who are in support and circled in red, are from individuals who are concerned. And now onto public comments outside of the 300 meter buffer. So including the late items, which were received today before 4 p.m., 
um, there were 125 letters in support and four letters in opposition. So just as a quick reminder, um, the municipality cannot prohibit the lounge. However, they can add on conditions or uh, recommend other thresholds and requirements. Um, the cidery must comply with the noise control bylaw. And there's also potential for uh, the municipality to enter into something called a good neighbor agreement, um, which can go through uh, certain noise mitigation measures um, and address parking concerns. For instance, um, if council did not want any parking on the street. So in light of this, uh, staff are recommending that council direct staff to approve the liquor license referral for Bow and Cider House at 1125 Grafton Road based on the following conditions, that the maximum hours of operation be 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., Monday to Thursday, and 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., Friday to Saturday, uh, Sunday, that the outdoor lounge Max, that the outdoor lounge's maximum hours of operation um, be 9 a.m. sorry to 10 p.m. or alternative hours of operations as specified by council, and that all patrons of the cidery coming by motor vehicle must park within the grounds and register their vehicle with the establishment. Now for alternatives, um, as I mentioned before, in terms of the uh, hour modification, um, council also has the following options available. The council approved the following lounge hours, Sunday to Thursday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., Friday to Saturday, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., and that Bone Cider House could apply or could then apply for a special events permit to operate outside of the approved hours for events. Um, and the other uh, alternatives is that council not issue approval for reasons stated in a resolution of council and that council refer the application back to staff for further information um, and then other options as determined by council. And that is the end of the presentation. So All right. Thank you, Natasha. Um, just for clarification, we've heard a lot of uh, people speaking today. Yeah. Two of the things, uh, obviously noise is the considerable one. Um, uh, which you know we are monitoring but yeah, right those bylaws and that sort of thing to look after. The other one was the um, the notice to people. Did we follow our notification procedures? Yes. So the two individuals actually I looked up, you're talking about for the mail out. Yes. Yeah. So they um I believe 1181 sawmill spoke and 603 Willie's Way spoke as well. And okay. they were on my address list. Okay, so they get a mail note. I like, I'm personally not the one doing the mail out. Like I don't do the mail out. I provide the mail out to our list, to our planning clerk who does it. Um, so I would assume she followed through with that. But, okay, and, yeah. and the timelines were? So the timelines for, for this particular um, application, because we don't have a specific policy we were going off of the cannabis regulation policy, which okay. is it's 10 days before. So yeah. I believe October 14th would be the deadline. Um, let me check. And so it was mailed out October 7th, I believe. Okay, should have made it on island. Yeah, uh, Liam. Uh, thank you, Marin. Um, Natasha, I just, like to add on to that, that it, it's my understanding that the notice provisions are all um, adequate and uh, and within the requirements okay. uh, for this type of an application. As is the case for all of our all of the work that we do, whether that's a temporary use permit or and 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 we try very hard to ensure that we follow those requirements and there's always room for improvement. I will admit to that because there always is, but we're, we're very careful to ensure that we do adhere to the uh, requirements. All right. Now, do we, um, do you have, you didn't put the the hours we heard from the- Yeah, that's the reason. Yeah, so I've added them onto the alternatives. 
Yeah, okay, yeah, that, that was then, yeah, okay. Because that's a significant change. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank you for that. And I'll go to Allison. So, so a special events permit. Yep. That's applying to the um, LCRB? Or... LCRB. It's the liquor board, yep. And, and that would change the hours. That we would be requesting for just yeah hours outside of what is being approved. So in order for a special events area endorsement to go through, it would be a similar application to this. So it's a time-consuming process. Then. Sure. I mean, well, there's, there's public consultation involved in it. So no, the like, timeline, yeah. And how I guess. I mean, we've got a good neighbor agreement with the Legion and we've got a good neighbor agreement with the Bowen Lodge. Yep. And, you know, that sort of thing. But, and this whole process, we actually received the referral from the LCRB in March. In March, that's correct. So from the applicant's perspective, we've been over six months before we dealt with this. Well, there are a number of things that staff and the applicant were discussing prior to uh, bringing it forward for the introduction. And then given the summer break for council um, we, in August to July, um, we missed the deadline to introduce it before that. And then I guess just thinking out loud here, um, if we went with this, this would, um, the red um, changes, then uh, I guess the applicant also mentioned something about there would not be any outside amplified music yeah so um would if that was included in the red would that be part of the license or is that something we could have a side agreement with the applicant that there will be no outside amplified music you could have that in a good neighbor agreement and be, we're all here and the applicant has said there will be no outside music yep and you could specify a time uh, or no amplified music at all. It's, yeah. Robert, you? Yeah, I, I don't know uh, if this is a question to Natasha or to Daniel. Um, very similar concerns to what we had with our last approval of Riley's um, portrait. What it's been running now for quite a while. What's been, have there been issues with noise? Has it been okay? Any feedback from that? Um, I don't know. I don't track the the, the bylaw complaints that have come to me, but I haven't heard on my law department. I, I too have not heard any. any issues. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sorry, Rob. I can chime in. Um, I did speak to bylaw services about the Legion in particular, and they said they had received uh, no uh, complaints, like similar noise complaints. Thanks, Natasha. Okay, hey, Maureen. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions, Natasha. The, the first one concerns the um, potential good neighbor. Yeah. Uh, good neighbor agreements ordinarily concluded before council provides feedback um, to the um, agency here. For the LCRB, I don't think I would be able to speak to that because I know the good neighbor agreement with the Legion, for example, was conducted in 2007. Um, so in terms of what the LCRB asks for, it's just a list of like recommendations and conditions. So I could foresee the LCRB not even reviewing the good neighbor agreement, um, but... Could we indicate as a condition subject to the satisfactory completion of a good neighbor agreement? Uh, if you don't, don't get it, they won't want that. Hang on, that's it's a question for the it's planner. A question for Natasha. Sorry, I mean yes, you you could. So we could add it as a subject in the feedback. In terms of, uh, you mean us creating a good neighbor agreement and then subject to that providing approval along with the list of recommendations to the LCRB? Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's okay. okay. And then a couple of other questions. Um, special events. Um, is it possible for us to identify 
uh, a permitted number of special events in the same way that, for example, Bowen Lodge is not permitted to have, I don't remember the exact number, but could we give that feedback that there's a maximum of whatever? That's in the good neighbor agreement. Yep, you could do that in the good neighbor agreement. So for example, the Legion, I believe, has 10. So you can explicitly state a, a number. Okay. Um, the, the numbers, when, when you add up the um, potential occupancy, uh, I forget what they add up to, but it's something like 250 odd people. Um, so that's the occupancy load uh, that is permitted. Could the applicants be asked to um, voluntarily reduce the number in the occupancy load? I, that, I, if it was voluntarily, yes, I, I don't want to speak for the applicant, but um, within the good neighbor agreement, that could be captured. Okay. Um, I, I was very much struck by the difference between the feedback from uh, those within the 300 meters and, and those without. Right. And I, I think that that tells a story yeah. um, that it would be unwise for council not to see the difference between the impact or perceived impact on, on local folks and people who are not going to be directly affected. And I guess that wasn't a question. It was just a comment. It's, it's, a, it's a quite stark difference. And I, I think that's another for me for now. Okay, I have dedicated it as well. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> um, well, first of all, you know, there have been comments about um, the difficulties of, of, of service, and uh, this is certainly one of those tricky ones, and it's not comfortable to have a big audience where uh, people are against each other. But I was, um, I actually, like quite a few of the letters talked about how they actually liked this, uh, the operation, wanted it to continue. And as we, as the audience sort of heard the, the, the different hours that we had up here a moment ago, uh, there was, I think, some reconsidering going on. And, and the, the, the questions that I was going to bring, I mean, for me, a darkness and quiet at night are critical. And that starts at nine o'clock, doesn't start at 10 o'clock. And, and so to me, it was all about outdoors and outdoor sound and no, no amplify. But, that's basically been done uh, with with the changes that I that I heard. So I was pleased about the proposed changes and pleased to see what we saw in red. I would add about parking that you know no parking on the street. Yeah. Um, I would add, and that would deal with kind of the capacity issue you know, to, to some degree. Um, and that, okay, I, I don't know anything about how to create um, a good neighbor agreement and even what the parts are. It would seem to me that the what we have in red and we add on parking. Yeah. Um, and no amplified music outside. I think we've kind of covered it. I agree. But I'm not sure. I could someone tell me about how you create it? I don't want I think to, I, it's not frozen. Yeah, there I go back to the same and it's about the noise. And um I this is what I'm hearing, as long as there's no noise coming out of the, the production here, um, then it's gonna be okay. Uh, the noise will be monitored. We have these bylaws. And we don't know what the noise is going to be. And it, it would be nice if we had a combination of what you're seeing and, but they pursue a good neighbor agreement so that they have the conversations that a lot of people say we're lacking. And they have direct input within reason about, you know, from both sides about, you know, what they require and would like to have and, and what, what the community especially the community around, because if for the outside community, there's a desirability to have this function well. But I, I, I agree with you, I'm not a noise guy either. And I, and, um, but that can be mitigated. And, you know, or they can bring uh, no outside after, after seven o'clock, seven or eight o'clock, <clears throat> and has to move inside. But that, that can be negotiated in neighbor agreement if they wanted to pursue that. Sorry, just to follow up, though, could someone explain to me, like what Daniel, perhaps, how do we develop a good neighbor? Well, we don't. You know, I was there for both of them. Okay. Can no. we? 
Yeah. Can we hear from staff? I mean, we've got professional staff. Let's let's hear from staff. I think one element, Councillor Hawking, would be to include explicitly conditions in the referral to the LCRB. Okay. And saying that council, you know, it, it is council's motion, council approve the referral based on you know hours of operation of this and these you know based on these following conditions and you list them and then need it be like and that these conditions be enshrined in the good neighbor agreement. Okay. So then it's not you're not deferring it to something nebulous. But it's like this is what we're we're concerned about. So based that we meet these conditions. Okay. And thanks very much, Danny. In that case, I'm I'm happy to provide my support behind changes I saw in red. Yes. Which we heard from the applicant, along with the no parking and along with a no amplified uh, music outside. It's, it should be another. Uh, so it's by, by no street parking. To yeah, no street parking. Yeah. Allison. I think. Oh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Um. I. Uh, um. I know about the amphitheater effect of the acoustics yeah. of that valley, and it's significant. And and uh, it, you know, I am, um, I uh, I think it's really great that we sent it out to 300 meters instead of 100 meters, which is the required. So that that was good. And it's just too bad that this is all such a surprise, because I do hear um, people wanting to make things work in their neighborhood. Who doesn't want to have a friendly neighborhood um, uh, relations? And so I'm um, uh, I'm along the same lines as uh, uh, Maureen here. I have the same kinds of questions. I suggest we add a condition and that no amplified outside music uh, noise be permitted, I mean, um, and, uh, and that uh, these conditions be um, enshrined in a good neighbor agreement, because I do think that this is a really significant change. This is outside the village. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at our official community plan, which, again, um, I wish everybody would look at our official community plan, because this is where neighborhood expectations are kind of in here, too. Uh, here's um, a few that are marked up relating to this. Um, Bowen Island, this is in the introduction. Residents often referred to the importance of maintaining the island's overall character of peace, quiet, and tranquility. So this is, uh, I mean, the, the green noise, it's the peace and quiet. We're part of the um, uh, main, what that, that was one of the dominant community themes the last time we updated the OCP. Here's another one. Um, community facilities uh, happens to be in there, but the idea of Supporting strong social ties and increased sense of community um, through providing places where neighbors can meet and recreate together and support each other in times of need. Like this is this is objective 152 for those of you taking notes. And uh, I think um, these are invitations to people to work together um, to keep our island as a uh, uh, a wonderful place with good support for what the businesses that are developed with community input. There's other ones here. Here's um, Objective 181 uh, to support opportunities that, to nurture the further development of low impact tourism, um, ecotourism, educational retreats, health and wellness, uh, unique amenities and environment. I mean, we don't want to change those. That was identified. Uh, Bob at the beginning mentioned the branding. Uh, the Bowen brand. I mean, Bowen Island's green oasis and uh, peace and quiet and um, uh, closest to nature was identified as an economic asset. It, it's something that we all need. And, and so I'm, you know, I don't know why we never refer to the official community plan. It's a legal document for our community. It might help reduce the surprises if everybody, um, whether they be um, well, anyway, I won't go on about that. But I, uh, I just think it's a land use planning issue. This is not the village of Snug Cove. It may be zoned commercial, but it's not in the commercial core where the pub and partisan eats and some of these other places are. Instead, it's more like Collins Hall or um, the Legion yeah. or uh, Bone Lodge by the Sea. So I looked up a couple of the uh, um, noise exemptions that we granted recently as a council. So here's one from July, 2022. Uh, we granted a noise exemption for a wedding at Bowen Island Lodge by the Sea, under our noise bylaw. And um, uh, as per an arrangement with the Snug Point Property Owners Association, 
the applicant canvassed properties in the neighborhood, they have to get 80% uh, of the 12, 15, out of the 12 of the 15 properties, they got 80%, they got 100% uh, expressed their opinion were in favor. So they got consent, basically. And then uh, the other thing is noise exemption policy requires, uh, anyway, that's the other part, that's the noise exemption policy. So there are two policies about Bowen Island Lodge by the Sea. And uh, the first one, I think, is the one, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. But one of them says, how many of these big events can you have in a year? And yeah. another one that I looked up was where the application made by Bowen Island Lodge did not receive the minimum percentage of favorable responses and the wedding could not be held because um, they couldn't. Is that the last one? That was March 29, 2019. That was before the last one. The last one was doing. Anyway, um, I just uh, I would like to add to those um, amendments up there and in red um, two things. One uh, that we add one that says that no outside amplified noise be permitted. Yeah. And the second one would be. Uh, following Daniel Martin's word, maybe I've got them wrong, but and that these conditions be enshrined in a good neighborhood, good neighbor agreement uh, to be reviewed annually. Something like that. Because the, the amplification, I think it's mostly like snug point in that the neighbors are close and uh, that it, because it's amplified. The noise sounds like it can be right there. And I I I hear this about over the years about the gravel crushing and the dogs and the different stump riders and whatever. Um it it can be serious. So those are those are what I would like to uh see council move in the direction of if people are agreeable. Thank you. Okay, that's very agreeable. Michael, go ahead. Um <laughs> in, in an attempt to be succinct, Natasha. Uh, can I just ask you, please, about the special events permit? Mm -hmm. When an application is made for a special events permit, that goes directly to the to the liquor board. Yeah. And then we, are we are we copied and are we informed that this application is being made? Yeah. So similarly, the municipality needs to approve a special events permit area. Okay. All right. So therefore, we're in we're in the picture, and we have also. A controlling right on that application. Yep. Okay, that's question number one. Question number two, would you mind going back to the slide, please, on the car park, where you're showing the car parking numbers? It's an earlier slide where you show the amount of space, the space available and or the space being utilized and the car parking spaces. You have a, actually you had a diagram, I think you had a plan. Um diagram. Oh, well, well, maybe that's maybe that's one. Okay. Yeah. Let's just look at. It. We're talking about twenty-four car parking spaces, and we're talking of maximum utilization inside the areas of how many combined? Close to two hundred. Two hundred. No, uh, it's more than that. It's one sixty-seven plus ninety-eight. Okay. Okay, well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So let's just go. Let's just get this number right. We've got two twenty. We've got twenty-four plus four. Now, uh, we've, within the two areas, what is the, what is the maximum allowable uh, the the, the uh, customer occupancy for those spaces? So the maximum is ninety-eight and one hundred and sixty-seven. Okay. Now, wait, wait a second. I mean, this is the story of the Bowen Ferry. It will only take. So it will only take so many cars, right? Now, I quite agree because of that. There's a very sharp bend as you exit to the left from this facility. Yes. Now, we've already established rightly there will be no car parking on, on, on the road. And, and thank goodness we have. Okay. So this is what we've got as possible attendees for any events. And they're going to get into 24 plus four car parking spaces. Well, what am I missing here? <laughs> the, way that, the way that the municipality or the land use bylaw calculates parking requirements is based off of square footage. Based on the square footage. Yes. The square footage. 
So in terms of the area of the lounge, and so the way that we came up with the 24 <coughs> parking spaces, we looked at the square footage of the first floor, so the indoor and outdoor lounge, and considered the tasting room, cidery, kitchen, along with the storage. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I quite accept, and I'm going to have to defer to Daniel here, that that is a method of doing it. But for all practical considerations, and I've been in the hotel business all my life, I'm trying to imagine that amount of patrons and that amount of car parking space, and I'm standing there with a square footage equation, and I still can't make sense of it. It does. So what I'm, I think I'm trying to say is that the actual operation of this, probably to the benefit of everybody in the neighborhood, is actually going to be, in all, for all a practical person, uh, reasons, limited by the amount of car parking space available within reason. You know, maybe everyone's going to get six in a car, I doubt it. But, you know, it's going to be self-regulating, which I think is to the advantage. And, and one, of the, I, one of the reasons I kind of support the changes that we're talking about, because I actually don't think it's going to be extremely difficult. And if you're ferrying people in by coaches, and there's not a whole lot of those around the island that are find, it's going to be very seldom that you're going to get that amount of people in that facility to, to all practical intents and purposes, allowing for the odd exception, probably not. So, so given that, the, that we are absolutely firm on no parking outside, but I also make fun for one further request that as you exit the property, and if you wish to make a left-hand turn, you better be pretty careful because sadly, not everybody goes within the speed limits. And I hope we do something to bring back some of those bushes or trees, whatever is possible, to give the best possible line of sight for people exiting this property and making a left hand turn. Because if not, it's going to be dead. We, we are going to get somebody hurt and hurt badly sooner, sooner rather than later. Because so it's like, happened. like the building center is the same. Yeah. Thing. So uh, I, I would support it, but I make the point that I think the car parking is largely self regulatory. And given that we have a handle on the special licenses, I, 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 see, I see no reason why the, uh, the, uh, the operation couldn't proceed on, on the basis we've already prescribed and discussed. Okay, um, Alison? I was curious about the requirement to register the car. Oh yeah, what's on some? So that was just because of um, receiving comments and concerns about the parking and the overflow of parking and how it would potentially be unsafe on uh, Grafton Road. Right. So yeah. if, we're, if we're requesting that they limit the parking, it is, in our opinion, a beneficial way of monitoring their parking if they register um, their patrons' vehicles. And that's going to let them do what? How does that work in practice, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> to, to monitor the amount of patrons like who come to register I mean would they give them a sticker what do you, what do you mean you sign in like you do you would just sign in I mean it would be based on an honor system because there's no way we can actually regulate however but if but I don't understand the purpose of that because they signed in and then the 24 spaces are obviously full um so the next person that comes isn't going to be able to park. Right. Well, if but, you don't want any parking on the street, or if you're permitting parking on the street, that's... Well, then the, the way to stop the no parking on the street is to have no parking signs on the street. And that's something that you can do if council is interested in moving that forward. I, I mean, I just don't understand why having somebody sign in for the parking is going to have any influence over somebody else that, that comes along. I think it was to it was to really just in like encourage dialogue between the owners and the individuals coming to their cidery. Hmm. <laughs> it, it, I think do you want a drink? We'll probably uh, have or give the required dialogue. Sure. Uh, uh, it, it'll turn out to be an op Natasha. I think in reality, it'll just turn out to be an operational nuisance. 
uh, for the people who are having to do it. And, and I, I question whether it has any material value to, the, to, to anybody. I, if we could drop that, I would be. I, I understand how it's come up through dialogue, frankly, and, and it probably oh, does matter, 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 but I don't think it achieves anything. No, I don't think so. Okay. I'm used to doing that in a couple of places that I go to, and it's be, so that because there's no parking on the street in any of those areas, and it's a way of preventing my car from being towed if it's there for more than 15 or 20 minutes. So they do that in order to control who's using their parking lot, and you sign in so you don't get towed. Sure, well, council can admit that if, if they see that necessary. Yeah. Um, can we go back to the slide that has the red markings on it? The just, yeah. And just for clarification, this is inside and outside. What? So that you're actually going to shut down the inside lounge at nine o'clock at night also. Well, that's yeah. what the app said they were going to do. Yeah. Maybe they will do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, in the summer each time. So I, I have a list of things that have come up, and I imagine you have as, as well, Natasha. The mm -hmm. first one is obviously the reduction in the in the hours from the special events permit to operate, and we had. And maybe I'll just go through my list. We had um, discussed perhaps having a limit on the total number of special events in, in a year. So that's a potential addition to this list. And it might be helpful for us to actually see the longer form list if you're able to. Can you uh, type things into the slide as we're going along? Um, I would have to stop my screen. I don't think I can see that. Folks, I'm just standing because yeah, no, understood. Yeah, a new hip will have to sit over. That's <laughs> like slowing for that. So, if, if you could just put up a white board. Oh, behind us here. No, 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 on here. She, yeah. She wants to see the. She wants to see the Natasha's typing. I know. I I'm trying to see whether or not there's a possibility to do whiteboard via Zoom, but. Oh, uh, should be. Um, Sophie, do you know how to do a whiteboard on Zoom? Yes. You're just wanting to capture the changes. Yeah. So yeah. Are we able to just copy that into a separate document, uh, like a Word document, and share that? Yeah, just any separate document. Yeah. Or a motion. I mean, ideally, Maureen, you want it to be captured in a motion, correct? Yeah. Just going to start that. Just so we know what we talked about. Hey, Natasha, I'm going to share my screen, okay? Okay, sounds good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you make that a bit? Okay. Got to change the hours of operation. Yeah. It's not Sunday. It's Tuesday. Oh, I guess it is. If they're not, they were going to be closed by Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. 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 So then, with the special events permit, yeah, you got limit of so many per year. No MCAP of the music committee. And that there be no parking signage on the street. There is one spot down by the apple trees where there could be parking and it's wide enough. Mm -hmm. to that out. 
Um, and this didn't get legs in the discussion, but it was brought up the potential for reduced overall capacity so that we're not looking at potentially 265 people being on, on the, the property. I don't know if that's it does ever happen, but yeah, just capture it for now. Um, reduce capacity to X. Has the like fire department reviewed the capacity? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the sign in not being required. Delete that. That's not in there. Yeah, but actually say it's not in there. What? Why mother? I think it's going to be an issue. Oh, really? Well, this is the best to sign in. No, it's a different, you removed it. It said and registered your vehicle with these yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. It's, it's, it's X out. It, yeah. it's, it's shown as X out. I think that suffices. And there oh, was something about the good neighbor, good neighbor agreement? It's further down. Oh, I see. And there was some, some discussion of the good neighbor agreement being specified as a condition in the um, referral response. Was there not? Yeah, I think this, this is a referral response. That these conditions be enshrined in a good neighbor agreement. Yeah, but that's not saying oh. that there needs to be a good neighbor agreement in order for the referral to move. Before the, before the referral moves forward, something like that. And I don't know. And what is the that. what is the process for the good neighbor agreement, Daniel? That was the so if you scroll down to the wording, just right at the bottom. Yeah, I would say good neighbor agreement between the applicant and the okay. Right. And, and then the question is, what's the timeline on a good neighbor agreement? Is it before? Is it during? Is it after? I'd like it personally. I'd be interested in having it before so that uh, the community can come together. I heard um, one of the owners, Jeanette, say wanted to discuss a good neighbor agreement is what I wrote down. And I heard a number of uh, yeah. uh, people um, in the community say they, they wish they could support if they could get together and uh, together find consensus and that kind of thing. So I think it would be great if it could um, happen before um, the, the municipality uh, sends this referral back to the liquor control board. If, but a question, if the top all the bullets go back to the liquor control board. Um, they are going to put them in the license requirement. So the good neighbor agreement may change. Yeah. Isn't necessary. Well, I, I guess my my idea of the good neighbor agreement being like the one down at some point, if I may, Mr. Mayor, I'm working in, is um uh, that it limits it sets it up for a. Uh, constructive kind of uh, friendly incentive to be proactive against uh, for for protecting the neighborhood because you want to have a positive relationship if you've got to have 80% of so many houses agree that you can uh, hold your wedding or whatever uh, event it is is it kind of sets it up that um, uh, good relations are cultivated that way um, rather than people calling bylaw and our bylaw staff. I mean, that's expensive too for the municipality. Yes. And uh, so I, uh, that's the kind of good neighbor agreement I'm thinking about is one like the one we have with the Bowen Island Lodge. So I'm one for the one that, uh, sorry, the Bowen Island Lodge has with the Snow Point Property Owners Association. It's actually with the municipality. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I'm looking at the, the noise exemption that we I'm reading from um, July 21st bylaw services 
Thank you. It says, as per an arrangement with the Snug Cove Property Owners Association, the applicant canvassed properties in the neighborhood in person and by email. The applicant successfully canvassed 12 of the 15 neighboring properties. And for this one, I would say a percentage of the neighbors uh, within 300 meters or something like that. Um, I wonder if we can do this tonight or whether this should we should refer this to staff to come back with further recommendations. I don't see the rush. I, I think I think we're almost there. Uh, but anyway, um, and then the noise exemption policy also requires that 80% of the neighbors. So there's two separate things. And the, um, I think if you cultivate good relationships with your neighbors, your neighbors are going to say, uh, yes, anyway, that's my that's suggestion. What you're going to do with that's a, what, a good neighbor agreement. That was my idea of what a good neighbor agreement could be. I'm just remembering back to uh, the application from uh, GLC and the Lodge. And if you recall, we kind of got to a certain point where it was clear that there were um, hurt feelings and angry feelings on both sides. Mm -hmm. And a decision of council at that point was not going to do anything to help with the hurt feelings on either side. And we gave um, we gave them some time you know, to to talk, and it wasn't successful in that it didn't come to uh, a, a resolution. But it did respect that there were legitimate concerns on um, on the part of both sides, and we've got we've got a situation here where. Um, well, that's what the, that's what they're gonna that's what they're gonna work out in the good neighbor agreement. I mean, that's that's what it's for. That's what it's about is connecting the neighborhood with the. But the, but if we pass these conditions tonight, what goes in the good neighbor agreement? No, we're not because the good neighbor, as you see below the submission and Scully's response to the referral. Those bullets are are the the starting point for the negotiations. And I also thought they were the referral to the LRS, LCRB that they put those conditions in their license. So if they're going to put all those conditions in their license, are they? Are, can they be changed? So, Mayor and Council, I think the officer to move a motion, you know, I guess would be referring approval of the referral to the LCRB with conditions the council has stated. Yeah. Um, and then the final clause would be saying with a good neighbor agreement between the municipality and the applicant based on based on those conditions. Yeah. You know, a, a different option for council would be essentially to defer consideration of this referral to a future council meeting with that date, like the December meeting. I think it's the, the latest, like that date that we have available. And then to direct the staff, you know, to work with neighbors and applicant on a good neighbor agreement. Those would be separate. Separate decision. Either you're indicating your approval to the LCRB with conditions that you, based on what you've heard tonight, you establish conditions and recommend approval or, or not as you see fit, um, or you're deferring it and saying to telling staff to, to come back with a, you know, some sort of draft of a good neighbor agreement to a future yeah. council meeting. Um, I kind of like okay. option A. But I'd like to move. Um, uh, okay. well, discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And Daniel, what would your sorry, Daniel? And you know, to do that, what would your process be for you to go and develop a good neighbor agreement? I mean, how, how would you do such a thing? Ideally, I guess we'd be looking to set up a meeting, like a meeting either with the applicant and neighbors in yeah. one meeting yeah. and doing work before the hand. So, you know, I'm meeting with applicant before, meeting with neighbors before, meeting with separate groups and saying this is sort of the best to come up with, um, working with any. You know what council heard tonight, and what council has conditions for, and sort of the regulations that exist in the ALR. Ready. And just if I if I may, Mayor. Yes, absolutely. Uh, adding on to that, we would probably send out the existing good neighborhood agreements as reference guides and identify the guiding um, points we have here. points that have been established by council, um, and. You know, send that in, in advance and then have a, a moderated meeting uh, and, and first lay out a bit of a uh, 
a, a plan to achieve the actual goal of the agreement, uh, not to dive right in uh, first meeting. And Okay. Now you're saying to just approve these for now and then carry on with the, the agreement. No, the question uh, from Councillor Hawking was yeah. just what would the process look like to establish a good neighborhood? Yeah, and that would be option B, Gary, the different option. Yeah, so it's either option A or option B here. But, sorry, but, it, but it, it, as part of that, we would need a motion from Council yeah. that would outline all these points. Yes, yeah. so that we're recommending the staff work with the community based on, you know, these initial points to develop a good neighbor agreement. And yeah, that's, that's, uh, these are the points that council in our <laughs> wisdom. Well, yeah, so yeah. So just here they're listening yeah. to this council input. They've seen the discussion and some of it's captured up there. Could we have a motion, something simple like uh, that uh, Bowen Island Council uh, direct, uh, defer this decision to the December 12th meeting and direct staff to develop a draft neighborhood agreement uh, and bring it to that meeting. Um, okay, can I just ask the question then? Uh, did we do that? Oh, yeah, I hate wearing these things. Yeah, yeah I absolutely hate it. Um, the, 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 the advantage of, a, of, a, of just a, actually directing as far as the, the what we're being asked to approve here with these conditions is that the outstanding item is the good neighbor agreement. Correct. If you take that option B, and then basically with nothing really deciding, you're, you're leaving you're leaving it to the new council, which I actually have a problem just doing that right now. We've handled it this, this far. And, and then that leaves the good neighbor agreement uh, between the, the applicant and uh, the uh, Bowen, uh, municipality um, to, to you know that to be decided because if if not it's dangling out there that's this way at least you have approved with these conditions and there will be a good neighbor agreement result right well yeah there'll have to be a good neighbor agreement because they're going to have to settle on the limit a yeah. year and they're also going to have to set on this overall capacity thing both of those are going to have to be done in good neighbor agreement. So I would be keen on A, sending through this to the... Uh, well, I thought there was a number in the X for the capacity. Well, we could... Or as, well, could it not be as per the good neighbor agreement? Well, but that's got to be the upcoming good neighbor the LCRB. The LCRB, this re whole application came from the LCRB back in March. This is now six, more than six months later. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're, they normally say they want responses within 90 days. So this is dragged out. And the applicant needs to, you know, get on with things. And it's winter's coming. They're not going to be doing anything outside. Yeah. And Mr. Mayor, you said no amplified outside noise. So I'm quite happy to send it forward to the LCRB with everything there and then have the following thing that we enshrined them in a, in a neighborhood agreement. Now, I guess the only thing is reducing the overall capacity, which isn't going to be an issue in the winter because you're not going to have 167 people sitting outside under a tent. No, sir. No. So there's time to do the, the good neighborhood agreement. And, and delete, take that out. Yeah, and if, even if the LCB had approved 167 if we've got a good neighborhood agreement that says it's only going to be 100 or 75 then that trumps the lcrb yeah so what have we got for a pre-law for this if you can just wind it up with, it. with the following conditions okay so we got the hours we got the, the parking uh, the parking signage on the street so um, which street is that we're talking about Okay, let's um, let's try to get to let's try to get this down again. We can't go on every street that's there. I, I think um, 
Very well. Thank you, Colin, on the no parking signs. A uh, couple of things. One thing is that we had a report about three years ago on how do we reduce signage along streets. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So this is, you know, and this is why we have too much signage on streets. We anticipate problems that may never be there and may not be an issue. My suggestion is that we remove that aspect of it. If it does become an issue, we can have staff then put up signs, no parking, but let's not start putting up signage for issues that will likely probably never pop up anyway. And I just gonna, you know, clutter up the roads even more uh with that. So that's that problem hasn't demonstrated already by the Apple Fest. Okay. So we're demonstrating no street parking is basically what we're saying. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, can yeah. I give in the line? Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, I think the priority here is not the timeline of the LCBO or whatever you call it here. Uh, sorry, the Liquor Control Board, or it's not the timeline of uh, this council or the next council. It seems to me the priority here is for the conversation to happen between the applicants and, uh, and the affected neighbors. Uh, to preserve and protect the quality of life of the neighborhood, peace and quiet, um, that everybody, yeah, and the good neighbor agree. relationships that a business would recognize. I agree that that this will trigger that. Well, by sending, by sending this um, to the Liquor Control Board, um, we're fixing in those hours. And I'm not sure that that's what a good neighbor agreement would come up with, right? I mean, that's that's quite... Well, it can be, it can I be changed. I, well, there's a special license for any special event. We've heard from a lot of people, and I just think the priority should be the uh, conversation that could happen between the applicants and the neighborhood um, before we respond to the liquor control board. It seems to me from uh, that that's our role as council is to is to um, protect the good things about Bowen. And uh, and, uh, and not worry about the details about the parking and which roads and that kind of thing is to uh, let the conversation happen first. That's okay. I'll shut up now. Yeah. Oh, David, um, thank you, Gary. I'm just hey, we're talking a long time here. The um, what what's the result we're looking for? We want to make sure that uh, from listening to the conversation, yep. the business is successful, that the community is happy with the business and the yep. community remains quiet. So I think um, while I hate the idea of, of passing something on to the next council that we should do ourselves, um, I think Daniel's option B is the better option. It's really, I'm speaking in support of what Sorrell is saying. And um, much as I love to just say, okay, we think these are the best, the best ways to handle the issue. I think we need to make sure that the community has an opportunity to talk with the proponent. And um, I, I think I'm hearing that everybody wants this, this to succeed, uh, but they want the community to be happy with us. I think so I think too. That's 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 three months down the road, two months down the road. But what's the rush? I mean, well, compared to what we could lose. Awesome. Well, I would like to be able to go down there and sit inside in the tasting in the lounge and have lunch and have a glass or dinner and have a glass of cider with my dinner. At this point, I cannot. I would have to buy a whole bottle and sit outside in the picnic area and freeze. So this, and it's winter time now. Nobody's going to be sitting outside. And we put all those, no outside amplified music. Everybody's going to be inside. And the parking is definitely limiting. And it's winter. So it gives six months to work on the good neighbor agreement between now and <laughs> yeah, in the spring, yeah. yeah. I concur with that. There's a small no. I move that uh, council defer a decision uh, to on until the December 12th meeting and direct staff to develop a draft neighborhood agreement. A uh, good neighbor agreement. Thank you. I wonder if we, sorry. Right. Yeah. Can we do it by the 12th, Daniel? I, mean, I, I was going to say, honestly, you know, I, I would be doubtful, but we don't have a scheduled meeting, you know, in the new year. So that, you know, sort of making this motion with the expect or the possibility that staff would come back and seek a future deferral. Yeah. 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 
Do I have a second? Okay. I'm wondering if we could add in, um, if we're deferring consideration, it would be valuable to indicate that we have the potential um, conditions. Can you communicate them to the LCRP? No, no, no. Just make sure that the master council is aware that it's gotten this. And I'm assuming that it'll be Alice and then Sue Ellen would make sure that that happens. Yeah. That's pushing it well into the new year now. Yeah. I, I'm just not in favor. But I what's at stake? Well, <laughs> exactly. Well, for the, the and it's, it's not going it's not going to change anything. It's the, it's the, yeah. Will allow somebody to go and eat and fire with their food? I, I, uh, Christmas. If you just put a little bit of space about between option B and the rest, just to separate it for a second, yeah, hold option B for a minute. Oh. Go back to the top. Thank you. All right. So it seems to me that there's one bullet uh, that the, uh, the uh, the parking on Grafton Road. Okay, that works. I, I, if you, uh, well, why it is it there'd be basically no road parking? Road parking. Yeah. I would rather see than mm -hmm. start oh. talking about roads because someone said, well, if it's not okay on this road, it's okay on. See, on-site parking. Uh, there's no on-site parking. No, no, no roads. Off parking. No, it's off-site parking. No, it's probably the best. Yeah. 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 Right. That is done. <laughs> Upside parking. So that's for sort of, clarity, mm -hmm. and then to. Not now to get into the reducing of the overall capacity, but to leave that bullet point to the good neighbor to it. Yeah. So right. if you delete that, if you just X, or yeah. excuse my X that, then that I would support. Um, and then as a condition of this, that the, the um, I originally had 10 in there. I don't know if that's going to be acceptable for the time being. Then this, this can be the good neighbor agreement can alter these all yeah. these numbers. Yeah. And then they're either, either better or worse. Yeah. Yeah. I think Council needs this recommendation to approve. You know, to ask the liquor board to approve based on these conditions. You know, if the hours of operation 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. And then for whatever reason, a good neighbor agreed it's at 10 p.m. Like the liquor board license would have been approved based on you know, 9 p.m. Oh, I see. Yeah. But they and they would have to do. I would imagine there would be a new like referral of the liquor board. So in theory, you know, the agreement that the hours contained, it would be a new referral to the liquor board and a new referral to the liquor agreement changed to the license. Yeah, the good neighborhood agreement won't supersede the it can supersede it to the extent that it's more limited, yes, but it but can't it. supersede it to the extent. But these are the hours the applicant said they're going to offer. Yeah, I know that's perfect. So, yeah. And so why not go ahead with that? Yeah, and the they have to still can ask for a special agreement, a special license for any special function. They can right. still apply for a special license. Correct. <clears throat> yeah. And then did we not say somehow we tied down to the fact that this, for council to approve this, there had to be a, a good neighborhood, sorry, the, 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 the neighborhood it's agreement it's right in as part of this? Where are we? Second, well, over. that's the chicken and the egg. Yeah. I mean, if the good neighborhood agreement has got to be developed before this goes to the labor, the liquor control board, we're going to be months down. Exactly. There. I don't want to see okay. that. So no. then, then the other, then it just has to have another uh, clause in there that says, and that a good neighborhood agreement. But what I'm saying is there's no need to have a good neighborhood agreement when that's all enshrined in the liquor license. Well, except for the point I think that Councillor Fast mentioned that the good neighbourhood agreement will open up that dialogue and will, 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 will be consistent. I, I take the point there. Okay, then we will ask. Take that last sentence. Yeah, I would certainly endorse that as a go for. But will yeah. the good neighbourhood agreement mean anything if that's the condition that the liquor control? What's it's a process issue yeah. you know, that we're dealing with. Yeah, I'm looking at Daniel, and I'm wondering if you've got any votes for I mean, in terms of like if, if those are the if council moves this, this option A with those conditions to the board, it says that we want to show a good neighbor agreement. To some extent, you know, it is less because we're not, it's not a, a conversation, but it's like, well, these are the conditions that councils pass on the board that would be in place. I would imagine that it would be an agreement that's outlining like 
some of the processes for, for applying for a special events license based on our noise exemption policy and the special event endorsement license. Um, and other good neighbors get things like contact information if there's noise issues or how to contact and sort of how, how to work through. You know, you the can, the can, on it, special. Yeah. Can, can we let our planner yeah. finish? Sorry, yeah. special yeah. Yeah. yeah, I could outline, you know, how council and the neighbors view a special events endorsement yeah. application because it's yeah. now they would come in, you know, we would issue notice, people would comment on it, and it could outline, okay, well, this is what we look for when when somebody applies for a wedding at this location, that we want to see this percent of approval of people in the next few years. These are conditions that we expect to see in that application. You know, that, that could go in a good neighbor agreement. They could just go in a, you know, council yeah. policy about special event referrals. And just keep it under the liquor control part of it, the LCRB. Yeah. Can I just uh, ask another question? Is it possible that another um, ALR property could also open a lounge? And that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, so um, any AR property in terms of uses that may not be prohibited by local government includes alcohol production facility, so cidery winery, and yeah. um, which can include a picnic area around special event right. licenses. Yes. Okay. Um, there's not as many, I think, on volume that are large enough to generate enough of the produce on site, but if there any AR designated property could open a cidery. I think I, I would like to. I would like to move this um, okay. this recommendation. I'll second it. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion on this? Yeah, where's the end of it? I just want to see. So it goes all the way down. You're talking yes. to Siri about all the way down yeah. to the bottom of the municipality. Yeah. 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 Yes, uh, and it's both an island municipality. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, so no further discussion on this question on paper. Okay, and opposed uh, councillors Nicholson and Bass. Uh, yeah. okay, so the next one is the uh, development variance permit uh, application DVP 2022 0247 uh, Road on Ramos. Uh, Daniel and Martin, back to you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's over to Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> So I was going to present um, a development variance permit at 14 Boulevard. Um, so just by way of reference, it's located on Tensile Boulevard between the intersections of 21 Adams Road and Tensile uh, to the upper part of Tensile Boulevard. Um, the property, as council remembers from the connection, is um, heavily impacted on permit areas and that um, this is our little map, map which sort of reflect the detailed environmental assessment done, but showing um, tributary to fish filling streams bisecting the property and adjacent to the property. So the entire property is within that 30 meter um, riparian area. Um, and just by way of background, so this property is zoned settlement residential speed. Um, their principal use is being dwelling and the front setback required is 7.5 years and I'll give setback. The DPP application that is before you is to reduce that front yard and highway setbacks from Required 3.51 meters. Sorry, reduce it to 3.5 meters from the required 7.5 meter by um, And then I just included here this the, the more detailed mapping that's included in the environmental assessment showing the various streams across the property. So stream one running down Tensile Boulevard or adjacent to it, um, stream two bisecting roughly the middle of the property, and streams um, that western edge and then along the to the south. Um, so as of time of the writing of this um, 
presentation earlier today, we received written comments from four neighbors and one additional comment from somebody who indicated they weren't a neighbor but but expressed their concerns. Um, so we received a letter of support from our neighbors at 1451 on Boulevard and letters of concern from 1459 and 1447 um, and 1441 Adams Road. I don't have a slide outlining those, but you've heard them today with concerns about the impact of, of the stream diversion in particular was a key concern from neighbors. Um, so the potential impact of diverting stream two to stream three about general flooding concerns um, in this part of the Tunstall neighborhood, concerns about impacts on um, the riparian areas, especially of septic within that riparian area. Um, staff discussion. So, discussion should this applicant receive this variance. Further permissions would be required both from them and from higher levels of government. So, approval would be needed from the province for riparian areas protection regulation. Um, as the applicant noted, we did receive. An email indicating informal approval of the DP from the province on Friday. Um, they indicated it as they were aware that it was subject to a variance application that was going on Monday that they were holding off the final approval until noting that if a variance was approved, they would have permit the same um, site plan as the development permit. Um, and so that wrapper permission from the province. Um, the, the application was to need approval from the municipality for a development permit for development within a riparian area. Um, and then finally, the stream diversion would require approval, what's called a change approval, under Section 11 of the Water Sustainability Act for the proposed stream diversions from the province. So um, the province indicates that this type of application, they, they say it takes six to 12 months, and the applicant indicated that they believe it will take about eight, six, or 12 to 18 months. So um, a, a lengthier process to follow. Um, and then staff discussion absent a variance, the applicant could seek to locate the house for four meters further from Tunstall Boulevard. So it would require still those other approvals. It would require wrapper approval, yeah. FEP approval, stream diversion approval. Um, the overall area of disturbance would increase. So the length of the drive would be longer. It would require, yeah, a further area that, of um, excavation. So higher than the 18% proposed, but it would still be under the 30% maximum that's permitted under that undue hardship provision of the wrapper regulations. Um, but it's, it's unclear the effect this would have on the other approvals required. So um, it may challenge the space available for the septic field in particular. So the house moving back may impact that septic field. Um, but this is just showing where that 7.5 meter setback is on the site. So that the house would have brought forward essentially as far forward as, as feasible on the site to reduce the impact on the streams. But, but given the, the small size of the property of the streams, that it's not possible to essentially reduce the impact further than that. Um, so the staff recommendation in the report is the council issue with the direction of the front yard and the highway setback. Yeah, okay. Um, Michael and I saw the whole wrong. Can I just say something? This makes the cidery application look quite simple. <laughs> um, I, I would like to be absolutely on the level here that I'm not sure I understand all the implications and all the ramifications of everything that I've heard. And I have the greatest empathy for all those householders facing problems of, of flooded basements and everything else. I, 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 you presented everything and, and if it was in front of a lecture class of students expert in such matters, uh, but can I ask the question? And I, it really resonated with me when I heard it said that really this is a small area which is part of possibly a bigger problem. And I am wondering with the interests of all these people with all the good folk in the area, that is there a possibility that in the, with, with all goodwill, we try to solve one problem and possibly create another? Is that a, is that a question? And I ask if, because if water, water, heavy rain is so unpredictable nowadays. And yet this is a problem we are told that's existed for a very long period of time. 
maybe, although we may be outgoing, perhaps we ought to ask the question that if it's been out there for a very long period of time, should we take a bigger view than just these properties you see here? And I ask it because I, I, I really do sympathize with all these householders. I can think of nothing worse than having your house flooded or living under the threat of having your house flooded or doing something because you believe it's really for the best and then wishing a year later under monumental downfalls, like, oh my gosh, that really didn't quite work quite well and those, you know, and so on, so on. Sorry to go, simple question. Should we be looking at the bigger picture here as opposed to being as myopic as we are and, and merely focusing on these amount of residency? Because my concern is, that it is probably we may have to bite the bullet and look at the larger picture to the benefit of all these good folk rather than just try to tackle this. So I appreciate what you've done, Daniel. You've laid it out with, you, with the customary expertise and thank you for all the work that you and the others have done. I'm just not convinced on hearing your comment and hearing other people's comments that we are actually, we're actually getting the the, the ground the thing, and, 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 and Councillor Fast has pointed out that it needs a, a more thorough, more master groundwater uh, uh, more management, management, management plan for this area. And if so, could we say it rather than trying to deal, fiddle around with this uh, with no real lasting benefit? And, and I'm having to rely upon other, the advice of others. I don't have the expertise to, to answer that in yeah. any time. Um, I'm going to go to Rob first, then I just want to show you something on here that I have. That's the question, Scott. Um, the size of the house, can they build a house on that lot without these, without us giving these variances? I guess what my concern is that people are buying properties, knowing the issues, and then coming to us and trying to get rid of those issues so they can do big houses on these properties, having known that there are streams and whatnot on the property already as is. Um, so the, the footprint of this house is about 450 square feet. Um, oh, 450 square feet? Yeah, yeah. it's tiny. It, it, it's, it'll be on three levels in terms of cardboard. Oh, okay. um, so, so in terms of that, it's like the, oh, yeah, the heritage house, we don't reduce the footprint of the house and the excavation area to about the minimum possible in a lot. And that's the point of the variance is to reduce it, you know, to, to the extent possible. Um, yeah. And so I, the question I, you know, can't necessarily answer cancels, like absent of variance, could this lot be developed? Some of that would be, could they get the required permission from wrapper from the province for the repairing area work and the change approval work, again, from the province and the water sustainability act um, at that greater distance from the road is greater, like closer to proximity to stream two and stream three. Um, yeah, I just, and you still have this one on. I, when we had that last discussion, I don't have a problem with the house, moving the house up and all the rest of it. Tiny little place, it's not a big deal. But I did not realize that this comes onto the neighbor's property. And by diverting this stream two into stream three, we potentially are flooding this property. And I just don't think we can. So that's where I'm mm -hmm. this is not happy unless somebody comes up and, and tells me that it's going to be absolutely okay. Okay, Sue Ellen, and then I'll say. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've been looking at this too and thinking. You know, one of the core services that a municipality does, besides providing drinking water, is providing drainage. And uh, I um, am concerned that we provide infrastructure like culverts and ditches to take um, water away. Uh, and but we also use streams. So we have to think about them as part of our infrastructure and be, be careful with them. Uh, as well as for their wildlife and fisheries things. I agree with uh, my neighbor here, um, Trustee Kale. I think that might be the last time I get to call you that. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, uh, I've got a whole bunch of reasons why it's wrong to um, adjust the flow 
uh, something that happened, uh, you know, we saw the videos, we've had these letters about the atmospheric river last year, and uh, that's only going to get worse. I mean, the, those rips, uh, climate changes upon us. I think we have a responsibility not to move uh, the cascading effect, I think I heard somebody say, yep, down agree. to other people. And I'm looking at our um, climate action strategy that we've adopted as a council, and under strategies to increase one's resilience to the effects of an unclaimed stable climate, one of them is um, protect built infrastructure through one of the points is develop a stormwater management master plan. That doesn't have to be island wide for us to make a start. We could, for example, think about um, the council uh, not issue this development variance permit until a stormwater man um, management master plan has been adopted for the Tunstall Bay neighborhood, including Chromie Road, where I saw those videos about the water coming down. It's horrible. That, and, and I'm just so concerned about it. I think um, if people's basements have been flooding and driveways collapsing already, let's deal with the bigger project. We've, we've got this policy for a reason. We adopted it only in 2020. Um, so that, that, that would be something I'd be interested in moving on, is that we ask staff to, uh, uh, you know, it could be as simple as looking at the feasibility of developing the stormwater management master plan. It might take special budgeting or expertise or something, I don't know. So, uh, are you finishing them? Or? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go to Allison then. I think so. Were you up? Oh, no, I was not. A couple of questions. Um, I'm really concerned about the impacts to other properties. And McKaylin mentioned something about a hydrologist report. Yeah. Well, has one been done because it's not in our package? The, the report from the in, Inform that yeah, is yeah. part of the. Um, it's it's the not in my package. It's in the really September 25th. Meeting. I've looked at. It. I've looked in, in the report for this meeting. I I'm looking at and everything's headed up, Madison. There's no report from the page. So, so Councilor Marston, right, right here at the bottom of page 43. Oh, today's yep. agenda. Yep. Page, oh, page 44 of. Uh, All right. I, of 40. So, um, they, but I guess so. But like looking at that, they haven't really looked at. Where the water goes after it leaves the property line. Uh, yes, they have. And um, this this question was asked expressly by myself at the last meeting too about the concern of the, of the flow uh, being diverted to stream three. And we were assured that the uh, hydrologist had looked at that and that their assessment was that stream three could handle the flow diversions. Could handle them, but can handle them. But what, what's the effect on even in a hundred year flood? It's what, yeah. if I remember the words correctly. I apologize. I, I remember looking at that, but I I didn't realize. Is yes, it, it, it does. It does a what? It, it does do a fourteen fifty nine. Right here. That doesn't show all of fifteen forty nine. It, sh it shows the stream three right here. Now, what about it doesn't show the bit on the right hand side? That bit that comes down and where it comes from. That, that just connects right with this top. Well, I can't tell that. It's, it's in all the other uh, maps further up. I didn't think. Yeah, it is right here. But where does that end go? That other end? This is coming from upstream and coming down. This flows in here and that flows. Um, from, from what we've been told from qualified professionals is that the diversion flows could be accommodated in stream three to a one in 100 year event. Who accepts the liability for that? Us or them? Uh, that's a question I don't, I don't know the answer to. So that's my second question is the third process getting the province whatever branch it is, what documents do they require? And does our DVP have any really, our, our DVP is only talking about the SPIA, the SPIA exemptions or the wrapper, or whatever you call it, 
is they're waiting for our DVP. But um, would the province even think, look at our DVP as part of the process for approving the re relocation of the stream? I don't know what they require as part of the change approval. Um, but I believe it, it's more to do with the technical reports and the more to what? More to do with the technical reports provided by the engineer in terms of the stream diversion. Um, and I don't know as well in terms of liability if that, you know, is the engineer assuming liability for the works that were being done, you know, falling with their liability insurance, or is it more on the owner who's proposing the works? So but so following up by us issuing the DVP, we are not assuming or possibly liable if there was any damage. So can, I mean, council because we're not doing anything to approve the moving of the street. You know, yeah, council's DVP is solely about moving the the house is located further from that stream too, and what necessitates the the stream diversion um, are the required setbacks from a septic field from a stream. Is that um, I go to the right side? Essentially, there's there's no place on the property that is um, that that is outside of the required septic. But are we approving anything that has anything to do with the stream diversion? That's not what the, that's not what the recommendation says. No. No, so, so, but by doing the DDP, we're just talking about setbacks. Yeah. And there's no stream diversion requirements for those setbacks. No, you're just approving to reduce the front yard setback and the highway setback to 3.5 meters. The municipality does not have the authority to approve a stream diversion. No, and we're not making any recommendations. So we're not liable if something goes It's a provincial decision. Okay. And they're not going to base their decision about moving the stream because of our decision. Not likely. Okay. And then the other question has to do with the, um, I mean, a stormwater management thing to me reminds me of culverts and drains. And um, so and the streams are a natural asset, a natural, and they take care of the water. So we need to be concerned about the amount of water going into those streams. Um, so somebody talked about the flooding being more than just this last year. So how long has it been going on? I think this was a member of the public. Yeah. 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 We could ask Bonnie. Yeah, absolutely. If it's been going on just for two years, then maybe there's some issues with what's been going on up above. But possibility. Yeah. But again, we, we shouldn't be getting involved with that. It's no, I, I just want to make sure that that there's so I don't have a problem with changing the setback as long as now where do we come in with respect to the just construction and making sure that the culvert and whatever they build doesn't have any impact on the tributary and just explosives creek. We don't. Yes, so the conditions that are in the environmental assessment are conditions that we would be capturing in the development permit. Um, so the entire site in the development permit area requires development permit and um, the conditions in the environmental assessment are typically what we would you know, be, be placing in a development permit. Okay. David. Um, but we haven't got that in the resolution for the DDP. No. That was, Can we hear from another councilor? Just to be clear, so thank you for raising this question, Doc. Just to be clear so that I understand this, if we are approving the, the, the DDP, moving the house forward, that the, the uh, moving the streams, Daniel, you mentioned that in your earlier report that there's sort of a six month process. So that the, the, the provincial government presumably will do a detailed analysis. In fact, and, and I mean, we've got an engineer's report that says it's fine. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think I've been involved enough in sort of their, their change approval process to speak right. confidently in terms of what they require, but there's where it requires their permission. So, I mean, I, I agree with Michael's first point. It's extremely difficult, and it's it's above my. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have a problem with that. I really worry about what Gary said right off the top. I don't like it. But, you know, I'm looking at the diagram of how it goes to the property below. That just does not seem appropriate. No. So I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Thank you. I've just got a few more points. I think 
more to do with why we need to develop a stormwater management master plan before we set the precedent that Rob talked about by um, of permitting this uh, by giving variances to our setbacks. Here's a few more ideas. Not only water moves, there's also gravel and sediment moving through um, with the current. And we heard from uh, Ray Frona about the um, substrate of his ponds, for example. But the, the sand the, that it had changed, it used to be mud. And now when it's dry, it's just sand and gravel. So all of that has gone downstream somewhere. And uh, is it going onto our beaches? That's a public beach down there at the end of Tunstall Bay. So something to think about. The, the erosion that these um, um, atmospheric river could do. I mean, we've seen some other things that could be also related to that. For example, the sinkholes along Government Road in uh, Sun Cove and uh, the increases in the water <laughs> in the sewage treatment plant in spite of staff uh, fixing things as they go along. And um, I just think the the stormwater management plan is, is needed. Um, it probably is, but let's deal with what we've got here yeah. it's late, and late at night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the recommendation is a council issued development variance permit DVP 2022-0247 for the variance of a reduction of the front yard and highway setback of 1455. That's Boulevard legally described as lot 128 block B. F District Lot 492, Plan 13685, PID 008 040 656. And uh, I will move that. Second. Okay, thanks, Marie. Uh, further discussion. I don't have a problem moving this part of it. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea, but it's out of our control. It's a province who's going to make the decision anyway. But what we are tasked with tonight is simply that setback from the from the road, and with the size of that place, which was the same discussion we had last time, I, um, I I'm willing to go along with that as long as the province gets on the board, not us. Yeah. Well, I, I'm in a difficult position because no one would like to agree, but if I'm not happy in my my own conscience, and I'm making something better. I actually, in this case, have a concern that it might make it worse, and I'm not prepared to look at that. So normally I would, yeah. you know, I normally say yes, absolutely. But in this in this case, I am really concerned that the surrounding houses, look at the, we go back to the little plan, the red houses and the blue houses, even I can work that out. Uh, I love a color challenge, and, 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 and generally speaking, I am just not comfortable that we've got a great decision here. So therefore, in my discomfort, I'm in the unusual position of not being able to support the motion. And I'm sorry for that. I'm just no, no, I, I just I just feel I, 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 I don't do not feel in my conscience prepared to do that. Sure. Further discussion, David? Um Michaeli's on on my yeah. yeah. I mean Michaeli's not the engineer, it's the other company that did this work. Um I'm normally happy to go with an engineer's recommendation, but I I agree that the significance here is is really so. Michaeli, I guess I'm just sorry. I think I think you already did say though that this really isn't your business. Is that that's correct? I would be for the first to say that this is outside my area of expertise, but there are some few points that I did want to um, reiterate that may um, help ease some of the concerns. Um, I did want to bring your attention to the hydrological assessment, and I, I think Daniel said it was like page 42 or whatever. Yes. I don't have the package in front of me, but the second page of that hydrological assessment actually has the map that shows the catchment area. Yeah. So talking about a bigger picture, the way that the hydrological analysis is done is they're not just looking at the actual stream itself and the water within the stream, but they look at the entire watershed and how much water will actually be um, um, will become from surface runoff in a hundred yeah. years flood in that entire area and then ultimately end up downstream all the way to the ocean. Yeah. And so 
that's the catchment area. So when we're talking about the bigger picture, that's what they're looking at. Um, the other part that I wanted to talk about is the climate change component. It is now standard practice for engineers to include a contingency in their hydrological analysis for climate change. And so um, um, I, I, and the engineer would have to speak to what that contingency is, but there is a standard now contingency for those assessments. Um, I also wanted to say that the engineer was also tasked with designing the stormwater management plan for the specific property. So a catchment or a de um, de detention field was actually placed underneath the driveway and it's much larger than um, what capacity would require so that the stormwater management is actually handled on site. And so I don't think, in my opinion, deferring the um, approval of this um, to wait for community-wide stormwater um, plan um, when they've done what they could for the individual property. I, um, I, I would be sad to see it delayed for that. Um, and then I also wanted to indicate that all of the water from stream two and stream three end up in stream one. Oh, yeah. Stream. It's only it's only five or ten meters, and um, um, that they'll be deferring. But all of that water actually does end up in the same system. So when we're talking about additional impacts downstream, there is no change to the existing condition huh. at fourteen fifty nine Huntsville Boulevard. There absolutely is. Yeah. As you're joining both of them before they go under, water, water. Will not have it be different. You do <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand it, but that you know, no. we could be here all night trying to understand it. Too. Uh, okay, who else? Um, we have a motion on the table. I just had a question. Okay. Um, can they apply for the stream diversion and then come back and ask for the DVP? The, the application for the DVP is a requirement of that undue hardship provision in the wrapper regulations. Um, but there's no point in the wrapper regulation change if they can't get the stream diversion. But so why don't they do that first? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe they could apply for the stream diversion. First, it's sort of which which approval do you seek? Yeah, so I put up the riparian area regulation here, just that saying that before the new hardship applies, the developer has sought and received a decision on every variance. So that's a requirement to trigger this new hardship provision. So before receiving the the wrapper approval from the province, they had to apply for the variance permit from the municipality. But they can't do anything until they've got the stream diversion approval from the province. Correct. And I don't know in terms of that stream diversion approval from the province if they require wrapper approval or not. I'm not sure how those, those two pieces are, are interconnected. Well, the wrapper approval has to do with the septic, right? The wrapper approval is for all the development within this, well, all within the riparian area, so within 30 meters of any of the streams. Um, and I know one of the goals of the development that's outlined in the environmental assessment is the goal to excavate for the carport to locate the house on site while that application for stream diversion is ongoing. So currently the, the home is located, I think, in the nine where the applicant's being distorted. So his, his desire was to do the, that carport yeah. and locate the house while the change approval is ongoing. Um, so I think that was that was part of the motivating factor of that kind of applications, but but definitely the variance permit had to be applied for before the development permit and the wrapper approval could be given. Okay, uh, one more. We got to wrap this up. Sure. I just uh, I'm looking at this uh, figure, which is the uh, approximate catchment area, yes. and it's quite small. It's just a uh, it doesn't cross any roads. What page is that on? Yeah. Page, uh, 44. Eight of 557. Five, oh, yeah, okay. 
I'm not going to the whole yeah. thing, sorry. And um, so it's it's just uh, it's just a small it's between Sunset and Adams and Tunstall Bay, and it, and it doesn't cross the road. So I don't I don't see that it's taking into account where does the water go after that. Maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but my feeling is that our duty is to the people who live here now uh, as residents, and I don't. Uh, I agree with Trustee Kale. I'm not convinced that we would be making the situation better um, for the neighborhood and the residents um, that we yeah. by passing this. So I'll be voting against this. Yeah, okay, thank you. Anybody else? You still got Michaela on the phone? Um, yes, right, when, that's right the, when were the pictures in your report taken? I'm, I'm sorry, what's the question? You got a bunch of pictures. Oh, maybe these are the other fellow's pictures. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. No. They're not yours. Yeah. I think these are McKaylee's. McKaylee, uh, do you recall when the photographs in your report were taken? 17 on. Uh, I'm sorry, what page? <laughs> Photographs on your in your report that start at page seventeen in your report. Yeah. Some of us are in the. If anybody has the long version, long version. Uh, I think these were done in the initial assessment, the initial wrapper assessment, uh, which was January. Yeah, I just was curious as to why there was water in the pictures, but obviously in January there would be, whereas August there wouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, I'm just looking at the method section. The field survey was done January 19th, 2021. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. So I've moved the recommendation on the table. Do I get a second on that? Yes, you did. Okay, thank you. And um, I'll ask a question all in favor of that. Thank you. And in opposition, Councilor uh, Sapp, Fast and Kale. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry to move through that, but I, I think uh, the province is going to get to uh, have to look after that. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't what we were tasked to do here. Um, okay, so then we're going to move on to uh, the temporary use permit, the TUP, the Bold Island Properties, Light Manufacturing. Daniel Martin, Manager of Planning and Development. I'll move the council to for consideration of top I'll second that. 0166. Okay. In favor? Uh, yes, thank you. Can we just say we couldn't have a long of this stuff? No. Sure. We're catching up for only two and a half hours. Yes, we do. Uh, yes, we do. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'll do that. So, we have to extend with the Yeah. All in favor? Yeah. Right. Maureen, were you in there? Yes. Okay, thank you. I just want to do the long winded discussion on that, okay? Sure. Uh, the section 219 covenant uh, septic for 894 Rivendell Drive, Daniel Martin, Manager of Planning and Development. Daniel, you're on. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. I don't have a presentation for this application. This is the second restrictive covenant we've entered into um, in Rivendell. So two of the properties have developed um, on site septic, and it could be the second one for the um, covenant that you do not see occupancy until there's capacity in the sewer system. Okay. I'd like to move the recommendation. Further discussion on paper, right? Thank you. Okay, uh, the correspondence, which is the Island Trust Conservancy referral for comment. Um, this Trust Conservancy three year plan, the recommendations council received. Yeah, this Trust Conservancy three year application. With that, second. Oh, question. Um, we're just receiving it for information, but is um, somebody here not going to look at it and provide comment? We're just receiving it for information. You can comment on it if you want to. We're, this is a referral from Islands Trust. It's a referral, and it's a referral for comment. So I guess all I'm saying is by just receiving it and not directing it to staff for comments or review, 
we're just accepting the plan as is, and we don't care what impact it has to go on. I can speak to a little bit if you like. I don't want to review the plan right now. It's too late. I just want to know. So, other than reading it and providing comments on our own, that's what we're going to do. But if we added and future comments by council and yeah, comments by future, I like that because they need to get the data match. Yeah, what's yeah. going on? So, so can you capture that? They are asking for uh, by a certain date. Yeah, I think. Yeah. By when? November 15th. So basically, we haven't got the capacity to do the live comments. Uh, but uh, when's the next? When's an only council meeting? Yeah, there's no capacity to have well, a discussion. No. So, you know, the timing, the timing is really yeah, that awkward with this uh, right, right in front of an election. And, um, we don't have a lot of capacity to dive into it. And it's also odd that it's stated on the same team about the referral. Okay, so would anybody second that uh, motion? No. Okay, thank you, Allison. And uh, all in favor? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and we will move on to the CAO update. Uh, yeah, I'm stand up. So, um, stand up. Stand up. Yeah. I will stand up. Um, but I just want to uh, take a moment to, to um, I, I don't have anything on my CAO update other than to thank all of you. Um, and, uh, you know, you have all done such an incredible job in in your term, and uh, and some of you have been at this for a very long time, and so uh, that is really remarkable to me. Uh, I've only been here for just over half of your this term, and the amount that you have accomplished in that time alone, let alone the full four years, is remarkable to me, and I think it should be to everybody on this island and I, I do wish that there was more recognition i was very buoyed and pleased to see that recognition tonight mm -hmm. um but i i am uh, um, very impressed by the legacy that this council term leaves uh there is an incredible amount of very tangible very visible work that you've accomplished that um you can be very proud of and but you've done it through incredibly difficult circumstances uh some that are uh widely recognized and seen by the community some not so much so and and i think you've done it with uh real um professionalism and real spirit and courage and compassion for the community and and i just i, I personally feel very privileged and honored to have worked with you. And, and I, I really appreciate that. And, and I wish you all the very best in, in your future endeavors and those that stay, are staying on. Good luck. All the power to you. <laughs> and those that are carrying on to new things, all the power to you as well. Um, we do have uh, some very small uh, gifts of appreciation. Um, and so uh, I'll share with you tonight. It'll be spread out though over a couple of days. Um, we're not doing anything at the. Uh... No, we're not doing it there because not everybody can attend. So we, I, I'm going to hand these out right now. Um, so uh, it's just a card. Thank you. And there's no or real order. It's just the way they work. Thank you. Shuffled. Um, and the cards are all by a, uh, a local artist, uh, Not by Jan. Lisa Arthur, oh, who I just yeah. discovered, Thank just you. gorgeous. And then also, I've got one more thing for all of you. Here with you. No, no, no. Were you hoping that money or a check would fall out? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. We, have, we had to make that pledge at the beginning, remember? Coming through. Wow. It's just, this is like the vlog. You, you like this one? 
So David, each of you gets to take a bouquet of flowers home. And uh, I made these bouquets myself last night. <laughs> I did, I did not grow any of these flowers, um, but uh, I, I, I basically raided the uh, general <laughs> store of all their available good flowers. Um, and, and then we do also have a, a local custom-made um, gift for you, uh, pottery gift, but it, well, it's not ready yet. And so um, I'll reach out to you. It should be ready within a couple of weeks. Um, and it's a beautiful bowl by a local artist who turns out to be, I didn't know this, I have a bowl myself. And he's like, this has been lovely to share with all of you. It's uh, from our interim library director, Jennifer. And so um, I'll reach out to you when those arrive and and, and pass that along. And, I, and the bowl was, uh, the idea of just the symbolism of a bowl is, is can be many things, but it's often symbolic of uh, of hope and of generosity and of uh, of things to come and something to be filled with uh, as you go on your way. So it's not lovely. Again, thank you uh, from myself, and and I think I can say that on behalf of, of many, if not all, staff. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, we're not here for the glory. Yeah. yeah. I forgot to get it now. Well, I, I got a few words too, but let's get through the rest of this meeting. Uh, so, an update on Metro Vancouver business uh, from Metro Vancouver. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be really quick, Gary. There was a budget workshop uh, on Wednesday. And um, I I gave budget elements um, a week ago or whenever that was. So we have spoken the numbers are the same. They did not make any changes. So for the GBRD, um, it, it'll go up 8.9%, 5.1, 2.9, 3.8, 2.2 over the five years. So, and that's seven bucks from six, from 76 to 83 for the average household. Um, for the other folks in the region who have paid for, um, Sewer and water, not uh, numbers of yeah, uh, uh, going over the five years to the first year, 4.5%. Their estimate um, for inflation over the year, they're using 6%. Okay. Um, that's what that's uh, Thank you. And the update to Council on Island Trust business from the Island Trust Municipal Trust Police, Bath and Kale. Well, sure. I mean, besides the Community Stewardship Award, which was, yeah, uh, thank you, everybody, for your help with that. No, delightful. And Trustee Kale, I get to call you that again. Yeah. I just um, mentioned that the uh, elections are all complete across the island, so it looks like another 50% kind of turnover. Um, there was a number of incumbents that did not regain their seat uh, as across uh, BC. And um, so it'll be interesting to work with the new, new trust council as well uh, on the trust policy statement and those kinds of things. Um, the poll, the, I'm assuming staff will get in touch with them about uh, uh, about the poll or you know, trust, new trustees can take that forward, whatever, and however that works. And negotiations will be with the province, I think. And uh, so we'll see how that all plays out, but there's also a few info, info items uh, to 12.9, 12.10, 12.11. And anybody's welcome to ask me any questions. Okay, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. A pleasure to ride the ferry with you and trust you. Yes, it's when I did. Yes. Good. I wasn't. Um, so looking back on four years, I, I never dreamt when we started, we would we would sort of form a group within the trustees who would work towards the uh, an independent management review. We would get the management review published, we'd end up with a governance committee, and we'd end up with a poll. And all that within four years. And for some of that, I, I owe my thanks to people, other people around this table. And, uh, and I'm pleased to see that the new councillors are actually reaching out and wanting to know more about that. And I wonder whether we were that good when we took over council from the previous people. And I'm really pleased to see I'm really pleased to see members of the new council actually reaching out to us. I'm sort of, we're not standing out there with our hands up and say, talk to me, but actually reaching out. I think it's very commendable, good sign of things to come. 
So it's been a great four years. It's certainly one I won't forget. It's been action packed. <laughs> it has been amazing. And uh, I wish my successors an equally amazing time with them. We will be following their process, their <laughs> progress very closely. Thank you, Sylvan. And good luck to you for the next four oh, years. Absolutely good luck. Yeah, I wish you all the very best on the trust. All right, so an update to Council on Transit Mayor's Council. We're not Metro Park. Sorry? We're not Metro Park. Oh, Metro. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Metro Park. Councillor Nicholson, sorry, Marie. We, we had a brief meeting on the 12th of October, and for the most part, the substantive content had to do with the budget. So we reviewed it. It forwarded on to the board. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then now the update to Council on Translation Mayor's Council meeting. That's a nothing. Okay, thank you, Allison. And uh, so we'll move on to 11.6, which is the move to a closed meeting. Is that the recognition of the outgoing council? Let's just do that. Oh, well, that was, oh, that was before. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, that's Sorry. I wrote it down in my head. Yeah, that's right. I just wanted to say at this meeting, just in case nobody else did, but lots of people have. But what a pleasure to work with all of you outgoing folks. And I look forward to working with you on other Bowling projects in the future. It's just been uh, great. We've got a lot accomplished. And uh, pleasure working with you, colleagues. Awesome. When is the wheel so. not party? <laughs> <laughs> the wheels are party. Normally, when something ends, we're, we're off. We're heading. Oh, right. It's what is known as the wheels up. Well, yes, yes. The the guy six is just out there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do. I'm with you all. The, the key people here that have made such a huge part. Yeah. yeah, so if we haven't got one organized, we'll have to get my Bob Trump and organize Tom. Yes, <laughs> and then the uh, Aurora. Yeah. And then, um, I'd like to say a couple of words as well. I, I just want to say some thanks. I think um, I think this was an extremely good council, um, and I think strengths are a couple of things. One is that we're really diverse. Like we're we have we're from, you know, we have quite different political positions and different groups that we you know represent in some way or other. Um, but I thought we worked extremely well because we were respectful and thoughtful and we listened. And and I think it was really valuable that we presented different perspectives because I learned from everybody. So I want to thank everybody. Yep. And and I want to thank staff, um, you know, Sophie, Liam, and we hope for the meeting, but all the staff, I see everybody yeah. back there as well. Yeah. Uh, it was really critical. We have a fantastic staff that, you know, over the over this term, it, it really um, demonstrated how important it was for us. And I really encourage the next council to um, to really listen carefully to other council members and, and to staff. Absolutely. So thank you. A really a big thanks to everybody. I also want to thank Maureen for running for the mayor, that was tough. I should have talked to you more. I should have ignored that social media. I don't like that tiger's pit. No, and uh, I should have. I should have helped her earlier. So thank you for that. Thanks everybody for your service to democracy. We're getting a little great. Oh, wait till you hear mine. <laughs> oh, he's got a long speech. Yeah, Gary. Okay, Gary, I'm going to jump up before you then, and then you can. Uh, you know, very similar to what. Swellen and David mentioned that yeah. you know the one thing is like I think we work very very I've sat on enough boards to know that we worked very well together you know I I would love to have dinner with each one of you like I honestly like everybody in this room yet we still had fairly diverse yeah. opinions at times and I think the vast majority of time we do come together with consensus and. We, we poke out those other issues and, and dive into them. And we, uh, but we also, you know, I've never felt that if I made a decision here that somebody would be, have a real, they could see that we worked it out and that um, I respected those decisions and, and survived. So, and Gary, I think you did a really good job holding us together, uh, together so, as a team. That was before tonight, eh? Yeah. So yeah, tonight. Uh, anyway, I know I think you I think you did a good job as being a team. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, absolutely. No worries. Why is Kristen hanging around outside? She's just late. <laughs> <laughs> We're not into the clothes yet. Uh so I had to write this down because not as elegant as any of the so. 
just before we adjourn our last council meeting, of which there was over pretty close to a hundred and change. Mm -hmm. uh, the last council meeting of this council's term, I would like to say a few words. The council, first and foremost, thank you for putting up with me. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, we have quite a journey together through the very challenging term. However, we were able to accomplish a vast amount of work in progress because every one of you came to the council prepared, open-minded, and with a willingness to find solutions to the myriad of issues facing the municipality and the community. Always with the aim to do what was best for Bone Island community at large, and maybe not universally accepted. Although not all cut from the same thread, that common goal unified our purpose and our focus. As a family at our tiffs, but we always departed this chamber or the weird Zoom universe as friends out that door. Um, thank you for making my job so easy. And from other mayors, I know it's a luxury and it is not always a favorable experience to say the least as I've had. Special thanks to all the committee work and for all the outstanding work done on special assignments. David on Metro Mayors, Council Allison, the Translink Board, Maureen Metro Parks, fantastic job. Michael and Sue Ellen on the Islands Trust. Everybody should be extremely proud of the work that is done in these last very tumultuous four years. Congratulations on behalf of the Bowling community. Thank you all. Of course, we can't, we cannot entirely blow our own horn. The reality is without the incredible work done behind the scenes by the extraordinary dedication of our partners in the municipality. You got a slurpy on us here? A little bit. None of this would none of this would have been achieved. These are the folks that kept beautiful Bowling Island machine on the rails, day in, day out, 24 seven. They're keeping the silence safe, secure, and preserving the standard of living we value so much. And it should be noted that staff has gone through some incredible staff changes over that period of time. And it's been also yeah. very disruptive in, the, in that orga, part of the organization. The entire group is so dedicated to Bowen Island and worked so hard, I am in awe and cannot thank each and every one enough for the continuing service for the community. So in closing, it has been a very fulfilling four years, thanks to everyone's help, and we can all be proud to say Blue and Island is well placed to meet the future. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No more nice guy. <laughs> Just put the agenda away. Ignoring the color, there's nothing in it. <laughs> that uh, we move to a closed meeting, that council moved to a closed meeting immediately following the regular council meeting to discuss items pursuant to section 90 uh, something of the community charter. E, page, and uh, that's what I moved. Okay, I need to check on that. All in favor? Aye, 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 aye. Right. Question period. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, no, no, Lester. Say on behalf of the end, uh, thanks to all of you as well. This has been by far the most like receptive and responsive council I've dealt with. And when I came here, like fresh, uh, you all went out of your way to get in touch with me and teach me about the island, and we're always there to answer questions. So. I really appreciated that and it meant a lot and I enjoyed working with you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we've done a great we've enjoyed working with you. We got that right. really, really fair. Yeah. Any questions for us, Alex? Yeah. What I have to Alex was coming up there. A lot of thank, thank you to each and every one of you that um great interactions over the past four years and just really looking forward to serving. All right. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Alex. Yeah, yeah. congratulations. Yeah. Good luck. All right. So, uh, you guys. We just find you. Yeah.